It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Renee's here. Andy's here. We're going to ask Renee about that picture he posted on Instagram. Hmm. What's going on there? We'll also talk about the new HomePod. You can finally order it. What's in it? What's it uh, doing? What's it not doing? And how you might want to use it. All coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 594. Recorded Tuesday, January 23rd, 2018. It's Hockey Night in Canada. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by WordPress. Make WordPress your online home. Plans start at just $4 a month. Go to wordpress.com slash MacBreak to get 15% off your brand new website today. And by FreshBooks, the easy-to-use cloud accounting software for small business owners. Make 2018 your most productive year yet. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash MacBreak. And by Molecule. Molecule is the world's first molecular air purifier that reduces symptoms for allergy and asthma sufferers. For $75 off your first order, visit Molecule.com and enter the promo code MacBreak. It's time for MacBreak Weekly, the show where we get together with uh, two of the best Mac journalists, sometimes three in the world, sometimes four, and talk about the latest news from Apple. Let's start with Andy Inotko from the Chicago Sun-Times. Great to see you, Andrew. Hello, great to be here. Like, Great to talk to you. Great to talk to... That man that I'm not talking to for the next three and a half days. I know what you mean. <laughs> to my right, Renee, I know Tim Cook. Richie from iMore.com. I like to think we all know Tim Cook. <laughs> yes, yeah. but you really know Tim Cook. So I got to put the picture up here. Uh, Renee was, I guess you spent some time with the CEO of Apple recently. A brief amount of time, yeah. So tell tell us this tell us this, by the way this is his Instagram post the most inspirational CEO of our time so great watching the game with Apple's Tim Cook which game so um, I was unaware of any of this going into it so it was a huge surprise to me but um, Tim Cook showed up uh, in Canada to visit he just does this thing where he drops in Toronto I know yeah yeah hour yeah. of code um, and there, Apple as far as I know never. I don't think they generally pre-announce his travel anywhere. Some people pick up on it or they know when he shows up somewhere. But um, Yeah, they just I recently, just the, the board recently ordered Tim never, ever, ever to take commercial airlines yes. anymore <laughs> because, uh, well, frankly, he's a target. And I, I'm glad he's a national that they treasure. Are, yeah, he's a national treasure. I'm glad they're protecting well, and him. And also he's a fierce advocate. put the advocate. space needle on a plane. And whenever you take a position, everyone who does not like that position suddenly does not like you. Yeah. So, right. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I mean, and for many, many reasons, and I think any CEO of a major uh, company, of course, probably also has secure travel. But uh, Tim Cook is the CEO of the most valuable company in the world. And I, I believe Sundar Pichai has an army of nanites that actually disintegrate. <laughs> probably, too close. <laughs> probably does. Uh, so, uh, the, so is this in Toronto? Yeah. So, well, I, I was just reading, I was just minding my own business, reading the internet. And I saw the Globe and Mail say that Tim Cook showed up at the Eaton Center Apple store, which is a big, Eaton, uh, the big Apple store in Toronto. Eaton's is like Sears in the US. It's just a huge um, Canadian retail chain, not a beleaguered one right now, busy shutting down everywhere. As but it's Sears. It, so the it's still, uh, yeah. So it still has, apps. it still has a center named after it. So there's an Apple store there, really nice one. And he showed up for the kids code uh, thing. And I'm just reading it going, mm, if I'd known, I would have done moved heaven and earth to be there. <laughs> okay. Um, that's nice. And then I'm like, how long will it take me to get there? Um, uh, but then un unbeknownst to me, uh, he was in attendance at the hockey game later that night and I was there and then I got a call saying, can you walk over to this side? Oh, that's arena? neat. So I just imagine, okay, so I had a big fantasy life that was completely wrong. I thought this was because we in America, we had these big football games on Sunday. And I thought this was probably Apple's box in Philadelphia at the uh, at the big <laughs> NFL championship game, and that you probably were eating giant shrimp with Tim for four hours, but no, 
No, uh, that's no. not what was happening. This was Canadian football, which we call hockey, where yes. you get to actually use sticks and yes. you can't tackle people, but you can you can, you can do all sorts of face. Like, you can yeah. check them. So, yeah. <laughs> and as far as I don't know if this was his, I don't think it was his first hockey game. You know, but but you know, it was his first Canadian hockey now, game. How did so you get was, so? Given the security, I mean, how did you get near him? Uh, I well, I mean, that, that I mean, I'm, I'm assuming people intervened on my behalf on that part. So 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 uh, they invited you to come. Yeah. And they expected you. And, yes. And, and, I, and they I, again, said, I hey, Renee, was, how you yeah. doing? Come on over. Tim wants to say hi. Yeah. Like, I, it, I, my expectation was just something like, oh, we'll talk to you about how <laughs> our, our of code is being deployed across the right. Canada or we're doing it in French now in Quebec or, right. or, or whatever. Like, as often these things are just right. uh, not routines. I don't want to I don't want to shortchange them. They're super important things. No, but they're but, they're they're press events. Press. Uh, yeah. They're expected. Yeah. And this. Yeah, and and he had done his interview. As far as I know, he'd done all his interviews. We actually ran one in Imore from a gentleman who used to work uh, in the, the 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 real newspaper industry in Canada, but is now a freelance journalist. And he got to interview Tim earlier in the day, and um, we managed to to get him on a freelance basis to do that interview for us. So that was great. So I had zero expectations going in, and then he was there, which was which was really great. I didn't want to take mm -hmm. up too much of his time because he was super busy with all the Apple people. Yeah. So nice. you didn't you didn't get an interview or anything. You just said no. hi. Did he, he did he know who you were? You've talked to I'd him before. I've met him previously. Yeah, uh, yeah I've, I've met him. I've seen him at the events, and I've seen him at some of the launches before. I never assume that he's going to remember me, but I say hi, and Renee goes, "I know, I know." Oh, that's nice. That's <laughs> really yeah. nice. Renee, yes. One question: Are you yes. still wearing the same shirt today that you will be wore to meet you to meet uh, Tim Cook in yesterday? Are you never going to uh, take I, it off? Well, so um, getting home <laughs> the freezing rain was a bit of an ordeal that involved hours and hours and hours of travel. And I didn't want to miss the show. So I literally drove straight here. <laughs> I, uh, okay, so Renee, the answer Renee, is I, yes. I, I believe, never I take believe it off. you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. And, and did you say, can I get a, a picture? Uh, it, it was like sort of like uh, there's this phenomenal. I call them cookies because Timmy's is already taken by Tim Hortons. So like whenever you see Tim Cook, or I think almost any famous person now, there's a lineup of people. This is what happens. Um, taking yeah. selfies. Yeah. So I was I was in a, like I wasn't alone with him. I was in a group of people. So I just I. I, and I couldn't like it just. I don't, how do you not be the one person who says no, no, no? I don't need a photo with you, sir. This is a, this is replaced. I've noticed this. This is replaced autographs now. Uh, yes. You pose for a picture. Yeah, it's the new. Yes. It's the new autograph. I got. I got to say, Renee, that that Pixel XL two takes amazing pictures. <laughs> I mean, that the lighting of there was oh, really you're... crappy. I do. I do hope you used an iPhone ten. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. You can tell because we don't look like paper cutouts. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, not in portrait though. It's not in portrait mode. This is no. A, uh, this is a. Uh, this is a plain Jane uh, photography. Nice job. Yeah. Congratulations! That's that's, that's, that's lovely. Cool. That's a that's a that I'm <laughs> I'm really happy for you. That's a, that's such a cheerful, nice photo, and it's not. It doesn't. I actually, uh, I, I I certainly wouldn't have put it past you to like uh, to have been invited to. Well, just you know, sit. Hey, you got, we're, we're, it turns out Tim's there. Why don't you sit down, sit uh, sit in the box, and then have a have a court, have a uh, uh, have a period with him. Uh, and so, and but because that picture, it's not the usual. There are a group of people each getting about ten or fifteen seconds to get a snapshot. That's a really good, natural, really good photo. Yeah, I, I, I you, look, you look like you keep, you look like you're keeping it together very nicely. <laughs> I, the last time I took a selfie, I accidentally turned the camera off, so I've learned to hand off my camera to the next person, Smart. so that they take the photo with me. Smart. Um, and he was actually sitting. Um, lower down i think he, he came up to the box at some point but he was actually sitting lower down with i'm going to totally mess up the names i'm not even going to say it but there was there's the hockey legends um oh wow who work on the sports i i am terrible at the sports but, but and people are going to be <laughs> super angry about this but there's an uh, someone who works in broadcasting was a former hockey player that he was sitting with that he mentioned in his tweet and i can't even remember the name now um but he, so that was it what probably was begins on. with gordon that would be my guess <laughs> or key or, or jacques Gordon Jacques or Guy, one of them. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell. You can tell by the hair. They they always they always keep the hockey hair. We know Tim is a, a sports fan. He's a big Auburn uh, college football fan. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking goes. he must know. He probably is hockey <laughs> fan enough to know who the people he's sitting. And with. I think Phil Schiller is a huge hockey fan. I'm sure several of the other people are there are huge hockey fans. How cool! How cool yeah. is that? Uh, yeah, it's very, it's very nice. And it was actually, it's so interesting. It really was a story that Tim was in Toronto. Like that's a, that's yep. a news. 
Newsflash. So Canada has this thing where like we always want to say we're like we're a big grown up city or a big grown up country now. And it's darling because you never see like New York City or Los Angeles. Tim doing Cook like is that. in New York. Yeah. Oh, Tim my Cook God. Has come to visit us. We're a real city now. <laughs> and no, you always were a real city. Stop it. You're just Canadian. You don't have to. Be <laughs> Toronto needs apologize to no one. You've got although, touch tone yeah, dialing and everything. I noticed that uh, uh, TD Ameritrade, uh, which is. TD, they don't ever say this, stands for Toronto Dominion Bank. Yes. And they call it Ameritrade, so you wouldn't think it's Canadian. It's not Canadian. It's not. There's the T. And RBC is Royal Bank of Canada, but they all move to their initials now. Yeah, yeah. They don't want you to know. It's fine. I no. trust Canadian banks a little more than I trust American well, we banks. We only have, like, it's like provinces. We only have a handful, and they're run by federal, <laughs> federal yeah. power. Yeah, exactly. Uh, did you ask Tim, hey, Tim, where's the HomePod? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I I never want to be that person. Like if, if if it was a formal setting and I was told to come in and I could interview him and ask him questions, then it, yep. I would you know just not hesitate to ask any question. But this is more of like You're uh, a social You're sort smart. of casual thing. So I don't want to be that guy who's like takes out the magnifying glass, starts staring yeah. intently at his forehead. I'll never forget Becky Worley at one of the Apple events streaming back to the studio. Tim Cook comes up. She says, Tim, f is FaceTime? Why isn't FaceTime more open? And she never got another interview again. <laughs> that was it. That was yeah. It. <laughs> it's like it's like you when you're when you're at like the the press events. It's like you know that if Tim is like trying to get from point A to point B, stop him. Yeah. And like and maybe maybe you can say hello and that and that's fine. That's nice. But you see people like trying to ask substantive questions like well, what what codec are you using for the new version of iMovie <laughs> that will make it compatible with? And you're like oh honey sweet it's adorable. This is your this, I know this is your first <laughs> your, your first time here, but well, he's not going to answer that question. I, so it reminds me of that I mean, old cartoon. Do you remember that like that Looney Tunes cartoon where the the uh, sheepdog and the wolf come into work in the morning and they're best friends and then they right. punch the clock <laughs> and then when you punch the clock out your best friend you know like like there's right. a, a, a very deliberate transition um, between off the record stuff and, and yeah, see, I, stuff. I, I kind of disagree with that. I think you don't get, you know, it's not like Tim Cook's doing press conferences. If you can, if you can ask him, a, I mean, don't ask him to show off how much you know about yeah. the Mac, but if there's something like what you said, you were going to make FaceTime open. Why isn't it? I think that that's completely appropriate. That's good. That's good. That's appropriate. Well, it's a, it depends. Like we if don't have to be uh, nice uh, to Tim Cook. I'm sorry. No, no, no. But uh, it's, it's like Renee said, I mean, if you're, uh, if he has in previous uh, events shown that you can ask him questions anywhere and he will answer the question, uh, then that's one thing. If you know for uh, – that's, that's why I make the difference between someone who has been here once and someone who's been here ten times. You know that – I know that I'm not going to get anything substantive from this conversation – uh, and so there's well, really no true. reason for me to bother. You got to be real. But but I, but I but I agree with you. If you if you are in that kind of a setting, then yes, if you've got a question, then you should ask it. Yeah. But but again, if you know, but if you have been if you have been there ten times and you know that he is not going, this person in this situation is not going to ask a, answer a question, and it's not something you need an answer to <laughs> right this second. Uh, then yeah no and in fact that's and honestly why I like rarely... if i wanted to know if facetime would be open i like i know the guy that tim would ask yeah, yeah exactly so, yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. better there's better yeah. uses of yeah no and i rarely ask i rarely interview ceos for that reason you're never going to get a ceo to do anything but you know stick to point and stick to script unless he's a wild man occasionally Although he was well, it depends. he was it depends brimming with malala i mean like he was just so happy about all the malala fun stuff Isn't that so, great? yeah, yeah. he was really on cloud great. nine yeah that's really yeah. neat However, yeah, had you asked him, he might have said, as a matter of fact, Renee, you'll be able to order HomePod Friday. It, or he might have said, we have nothing to discuss about HomePod in Canada, Renee. Sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> only in the U.S., Australia, uh, yeah. and the U.K. Sorry, Canada. Yeah. France and Germany this spring. That's almost Canada. <laughs> uh, isn't, it, isn't it great to have to have just this one reason once again for other countries to wish they were American? Because we, we've lost. We, we used to there count on that, but now <laughs> there are only a few areas, and one of them is Apple product availability. So the HomePod uh, available for pre-order Friday, and we will arrive Friday, February 9th, two weeks uh, later. Uh, I'll, of course, order one immediately. Uh, we saw the rumor that there would be a million available initially and a total of something like 12 million available for the year. I don't know how accurate uh, that is. You, Renee, have heard the HomePod. Yes. Uh, and you, you said it sounds really good. 
compared to what was available when it was announced, which was June of 2017, it sounded way better than both the Sonos. Well, it sounded better than the Sonos and way better than the Echo. But since then, both companies have released yeah. new products. So I'm looking forward Even to Google testing has it against a, like, uh, large Google, yeah, Google now, Max, Sonos Max. One, yeah. the Echo. Is it the Echo 2? Uh, yeah, the second generation Echo yeah. is supposed to be better, and the Echo Home sounds uh, pretty good. I would that's probably the one I'll compare it with. It is, after all, only seven inches tall. It's hard to make a really good speaker system that's compact like that. Uh, it has a, a woofer that fires up, which is interesting. Six microphone array, seven tweeters around the base. It has an A8, which is a pretty yeah. powerful chip for a speaker. We have um, made a mock up of the speaker to give you uh, some idea of its of its size and shape. I think this is a roll of toilet paper inside here. I don't know. And uh, and I apologize for the poor caricature of the Apple logo. That's I, the silver, not the space gray, right? Yes, this is the silver one. So um, I was going to order two. I think I may still order two, but the Apple says that they the uh, previously announced ability to uh, do multi-room play uh, synchronized play and pair up and become a stereo set when you have two of them in the same room will not come till later in the year. So, I mean, they, uh, a lot of this deals with airplay too. And airplay too, I think is just in the, in the latest beta, but it was in previous betas and it was pulled. And that's the feature that's going to enable multi-room. The stereo thing I think is a little bit confusing because the home pod does computational audio where it's bouncing things off the walls and figuring out where to play sounds in a room. So it sounds like it doesn't sound like stereo, I think, is completely the wrong terminology, and I'm not sure why no, no, Apple is no, no. using it. Yeah, Apple's using it. It says if yeah. this is from the press release, if there's more than one home pod set up in the same room, the speakers can be set up as a stereo pair for even Which more. I'm confused about because originally, like when I heard it, it, it definitely sounded like full room audio. It didn't sound like it was coming from one side. And my understanding was you'd add extra ones to increase the volume. Like if you had a really large room and you wanted to fill it, you could put two, three, four in, and they would understand that they were there, and they would expand the, the scope of this of this 360 audio. So I'm not, I have to ask Apple what they mean by stereo in this context. I, I, I do have to say that this is something I'm going to have to really follow closely because it's, it's not the only speaker that adapts its acoustics to f uh, fill to fit whatever space it's in, uh, particular other speakers, particularly they want to be aware. Am I in a, is the speaker in a corner? Is the sp is speaker in the middle of, uh, in, in the middle of nowhere? Uh, and I don't, I'll, I'll be very, very pleased if it can deliver the sort of audio experience of two separate speakers. I'm a little bit skeptical. I think that it'll, I think that it'll be excellent sound, but I have spent like the past, uh, several months, uh, since the uh, since HomePod was uh, was first uh, first announced, intentionally trying to get in as many like three to four hundred dollar like two speaker systems uh, in the office, and comparing that to like a Sonos, comparing that to whatever good stuff I can get my hands on, and none of them can really fill a room and make you feel like you're in the middle of an engineered sound space, like two separate speakers a distance apart placed somewhere sensible inside the room. So we're gonna have to see how that works. And, not, and it, sh it should also be mentioned that it, it's you really have to compare apples to apples to apples here. Uh, a single <laughs> people people are used. I think today people are using a single speaker differently than someone who wants to have a two speaker setup. They don't necessarily want that really rich stereo environment. They just want. You know this really weird, bizarre L-shaped room to have some good music in it, and maybe they're not even going to be sitting in the sweet spot, so to speak. I mean, they're going to be they're going to be laying in bed while this thing is like someplace off in the corner. So it's not even necessary that it uh, that it replace that kind of uh, stereo thing. I just think that we should make sure that we have the correct expectations for what we're, what we're about to see. I think that good good sound is really all we can count on. You're probably accurate that people don't listen that way, and if you did. And there are people who do who want to sit down on a sofa and have stereo speakers. You're not going to be doing it with a HomePod anyway. That, that that's this is a different use case. Well, it's possible HomePod. it could be like I I am terrible at music. Uh, it, I, I I have a design background, not an audio background. I'm terrible at it, but it might just be cleaner because when you're throwing audio through a room from a single source, maybe it bleeds or I don't know what the right terms are. I really well, we have, I mean, stuff. if you're an audio <laughs> file, you're adjusting. You know, uh, even even at a at a co consumer range, you know most. Uh, stereo systems, most receivers have uh, something like Odyssey is 
one technology that has a microphone that you place at the seating position yeah. and it yeah. tunes the speakers. I mean, this is not anything new. And I'm sure if you're an audiophile, you you know exactly what you're doing and you're probably using a sound pressure meter and all sorts of stuff to... You have 9.1. You're not worried yeah. about any single speaker. Well, maybe you, you do. I, you know, I think a lot of purists say, no, let's let's do stereo. Let's not do surround sound. Well, know? they have vinyl speakers, right? I mean, that's what yeah, I... Yeah, they have vinyl speakers. <laughs> Andy just bought a record player, so, you know... Uh, it, just, it just arrived today. <laughs> that's, There's, that's but cool. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, this is why audio is such an exciting category right now. We're kind of redefining what, what good audio means. Uh, where people people absolutely want the best quality sound if they have a chance to test out like a Sonos versus the both versus the HomePod and they like one better that's they're not going to simply say the sound quality doesn't matter. However, I mean I'm I myself am surprised I don't have uh, I don't have like all my audio stuff set up in the bedroom for instance yet. So all I really have is a Google Home speaker and I'm surprised at how much I'm enjoying just like as I'm reading in bed or something. It's okay that I'm not getting the, you know, the the Budokan, like Stonehenge, like speakers, <laughs> room filling experience. All I want is something, it's it's okay for it to be a mono source, but to be really good, rich sound. And this is coming from a speaker the size of a cantaloupe that costs $129, yeah, exactly. $150. So it's, it's, a, it's a new metric, and I'm really excited to see what Apple's doing with yeah, HomePod. $349 point, like, US, white and space gray, US, UK, Australia, pre-order Friday. Um yeah, at that price point, you know, I mean, I think you're, I think people put them in every room. Is it, is it, Renee, you think more about Siri or more about music or both? So, um, well, one thing I, I think Apple really is positioning this as like, if you look at, um, AirPod, AirPods, sorry, those are close band. Um, they are, they're a music first device, but they also put Siri right, you know, literally right into your ears. And this is wideband. Like this is far, far range. Uh, this is, beam forming microphones. This is something the technology that Echo has been using for a long time and Google has put into Google Home. It's putting Siri on a device that can actually hear you. If if we have music blaring and I'm standing next to Andy and I say, uh, hey, Shlomo, do this. Shlomo can hear me even if Andy necessarily can't distinguish right. what I'm saying. And that right. requires this hardware. But I think it's very similar right now to AirPods where, to Andy's point, for someone who really wants to go to the trouble of setting up a Dolby Atmos system and 9.1 sound and have the perfect room, that's fine. But many people can't or just don't want to have to go to the effort of, of yeah. wiring all that up. And they could put a single, easy to, I mean, you, you tap your iPhone to set it up. And it and it uses computational audio the way that um, depth effect, that portrait mode on a phone uses computational photography. Yes, you can get the big DSL, DSLR and all the lenses and learn how to shoot and do all that and get a nice portrait photo. Or you can use your iPhone and get one that for most people is emotionally at least good enough. And this will give really good, you know, good enough audio. But it, it sounds like Apple is really tuning this as music first. Like they've invested heavily in Siri, but it's in building out Siri's domain knowledge about music so that it is uh, you, you can never say bulletproof with anything that's server side, but that it really understands deep, deep context um, and metadata and information about music. And it'll be really like a first class musical assistant. And they've added HomeKit functionality to it. But I think that's sort of stage two. And this is going to be, as as is often the case with Apple, an iterative process where, you know, like Apple Watch version one, Lee, we talked about this many, many times compared to where it is now. <laughs> I think we'll see HomePod as sort of Apple's first step into this. Do you think and they'll then, do a range of bigger and smaller speakers as Google and Amazon have done? I I don't I don't know how much will do, I think they'll bring something in underneath because I think there's a large umbrella underneath $350 for a speaker and there's room to have something yeah. there. Um, but I also think they'll iterate quickly on this and maybe we'll get Series 2 and Series 1 HomePod next right. and the cheaper will be Series 1. But also they'll like there's like the Siri kit right now is very bare bones like it'll do some things but it won't do ride sharing for example it'll do things like you can use messenger apps you can tell i can say whatsapp andy uh blah 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 and it'll do that for me fine so it'll integrate with all messaging apps but it doesn't have a very wide range of integrations yet. what is and the support that's for cool. this this is this is the siri kit that uh yes apple wants third parties to uh, adopt what is what is the support for this look like? Are there a lot of Siri Kit apps now? Not so far. So Apple has a very different approach to Amazon, and I mean they both have pros and cons. Amazon's let them do incredibly rapid deployment, uh, but uh, Brian Romelli, who's really good at voice first, that had a good analogy. And he said like, if you got in first with pizza, too bad if your Domino's or pizza, because that first developer owns pizza on Alexa, and that's going to be something that Amazon has to fix eventually. Apple is building these things out very slowly. 
um, and doing a lot of uh, contextual domain knowledge on them. But it, it's probably too slowly because, I, as far as I know, there's like there's to dos. It'll it'll integrate with things like OmniFocus and things, and there's uh, messaging, so it'll integrate with things like Skype and WhatsApp and um, you know other different. In, in addition to iMessage, it but says just in so their, much else in their there. PR, it says Siri Kit messaging lists and notes and notes, and yeah. that's it. So that and means it really needs music. Like you, one you the, couldn't the, make a restaurant reservation. You couldn't. Not yet. No. It, yeah, it's going to be fairly limited. Although I suspect messaging lists and notes covers most of the use cases, even people with Amazon Echoes. Uh, they set timers. I mean, that's what we saw based yeah. on the data. And you can set a timer set, on this, right? I mean, set, it's like, yeah, set timers, play music, all the basic if, stuff. If but you're an nice Apple Music nerds. user, this is definitely the right choice for you because of the direct integration to Apple Music. Yeah, and there's some confusing language in there that I have to follow up on too about your iTunes library that I'm not clear yeah. if that's just iTunes in the cloud. So if you if you do pay for iTunes in the cloud, I have to figure out exactly what they mean by that. But if just from pure Apple Music context, it's basically you ask Siri for a song, and if that song is in the Apple. And the nice thing about so it if is I run you, uh, Apple's Music Match technology, uh, would that mean that my entire it's library? It's unclear to me. That's okay. unclear to me. I want to find that out. But if you say, for yep. example, play Smooth Criminal by by Michael Jackson or by Alien Ant Farm or by Glee, you'll get whatever version of the song you want. And you can ask for it in different ways and based on, you know, top charts and, and a, a vast array of different uh, metrics. Actually, I'm yeah, looking that's, that's at the, the examples history. in the Siri kit. Siri kit's much more capable than the limited stuff it's going to allow the HomePod to do. You can make a voice call. You can get rides. But that's not hard to see that stuff's all coming. It's just it has yeah, to get here. That's a that's a so. Don't be fooled by the stuff you can do with Siri on the smartphone. It's it isn't the same as on the HomePod. It's not a it's not that full it's Siri platform. Kit integration. One of the yeah. problems is that it, you never know which platform Siri can do what on, and that has to be fixed because yeah. if you can't yeah. rely on a technology to be there, you won't use it. That's that's why I think that Apple is really making making their smart speaker perfect for Apple. Meaning that this is why they're really not trying to identify it as a smart speaker. They're trying to say, Matt, look how great, listen to how great this sound is and listen to how great this will be for listening to Apple Music on. If they were trying to advertise it and market it the way that uh, Google uh, advertises uh, Google Home or Amazon uh, does Alyosha, they would it's sort of like the same reason why they didn't try to sell the iPad as a notebook because that makes people say, well, why isn't there a USB port? Why isn't there a keyboard? Why isn't there a printer port? Why isn't there a networking port? If you say this is a really wonderful speaker that responds to voice commands, they can then have people listen to an Echo speaker next to this speaker and say, wow, this really kicks Amazon's butt that way. Uh, but that that what Renee brought up is exactly what I was trying. I've been trying to figure out over the past 24 hours, like uh, if uh, if uh, uh, I have I do ha I do have an uh, an Apple Music account, but pretty much just for research, all my music is on a server or it's stuff that uh, stuff I'm using uh, iTunes Match for. This would really not be a gr this this would be a lesser return on a three hundred fifty dollar investment if it's awesome. Uh, if, if if the only way that it will do what I would expect it to do with voice commands and music is if I have a subscription to Apple Music. If it can't if it can't you know give me uh, tracks from this album, which is not on Apple Music at all, uh, then it's not useless. But you, you, uh, you, pr you want you, you're sort of asking me to ask you how come these other people that aren't don't have as much money in the bank as you do, Apple can figure this out, but somehow you can't. So there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of people on Friday uh, the, the the day that uh, HomePod ship uh, who are writing about this stuff who are just going to be. <laughs> trying to find every piece of music they have that is not on Apple Music to see if it can do anything with it. it it'll, it'll almost certainly work with AirPlay, but then we get into the and problem. Well, the if, I'm, if I'm using it as an AirPlay speaker, I can now buy a Google Home Max uh, speaker instead because that will still uh, that will still Chromecast. It I might be hard though for my Apple apps. to find well, stuff that's not on Apple too. Music. Apple Music has a pretty good. Pretty but you know, range. like the the Andy and Jim Dalrymple problem is, I have my like I want the third Aussie yeah, yeah. live track that yeah. I. And, but the new problem is that it's like the first thing people asked is why doesn't it work with um, Spotify? Because a lot of people these days, like some people, they just don't have. They never bought stuff on iTunes. They're not going to start now. They never bought CDs. Not going to start now. Their entire life has been just streaming stuff. But they've already they already have a relationship with a specific service, um, and they want that service. And we don't have Siri Kit yet for podcasts. Like it'll do Apple Podcasts, but like if you prefer a different client like Pocket Cast or Overcast or something, or won't like uh, well, what's the Audible support going to be? Because I want to listen to those yeah. books. 
Um, almost, or just I can tell you like that Audible, that's almost certainly it will not support Audible. But it, I mean, at some point, Siri Kit has to be open to audio sources. It's just it's such a you obvious. You know, Google, I can't play my audio books either. Uh, yeah, they've actually just opened their own audio book store instead of cutting a deal of with that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suspect uh, you'll. And Apple does sell audio books from audible on itunes yeah. but that's different and uh just because you own but, it on again, audible you doesn't can mean... airplay it so if you if you if you buy one of these and you really yeah. and you can like some people are worried about apple tv this is a an mm -hmm. airplay endpoint so you can point your apple tv at it too so if you're in a small environment or you just only want to buy one thing you can absolutely buy this one thing and airplay to it but then it's like before we had amazon prime video on the apple tv it's like you just don't feel like you're a first class citizen well it's i have like, to I'm say yeah, having, it it's a little Having a purchased the, Sonos, the expensive Sonos One and finding out that it doesn't do the full Amazon Echo, that it won't, for instance, read audiobooks, really is a bad experience for end users. That is very frustrating. I suspect some people will have the same kind of frustration if it can't do everything Siri can do on your phone. It's not a full Siri experience. Well, it's the same also, thing with the Mac. Like, the Mac won't do HomeKit. Like, why won't the Mac do HomeKit? Yeah, I, yeah. I don't understand well, also, I mean, just as much as I said that this is a great way for Apple to promote this, saying this is a great speaker. Now you're you're also you're also sort of telling people to think of this as a speaker, meaning that it doesn't you're, the, the speakers that I'm used to are not ones that are tied to one music service. So that it's not even uh, a case of being an audiophile. Uh, like I'm not I'm not on on Jim Dalrymple's uh, level uh, by any means. But it's like even if it's as simple as that. Yes, but I. I have been using uh, I've been using Spotify. That's where all of my playlists are, and that's where all my collected libraries are. And if you're telling me that not only do I have to start paying ten bucks a month to Apple Music to get this that sort of functionality through the speaker that I already paid three hundred fifty dollars for, but I'm also going to have to convert all of my playlists and all my libraries to Apple Music. That's you're you're not selling me a, a home. You're not selling me a speaker. You're selling me an add-on to a service that you're trying to sell me. And that's it's not like it's 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 kind of a step back from the from the Apple Wi-Fi, Apple Hi-Fi, uh, the iPod Hi-Fi. So that's I mean that, so this is it's it's just a speaker. You plug it in and it plays music. And I just hope that <laughs> I just hope that the HomePod, at least within the first year, has kind of that same sort of approach to it. I don't want it just to be an accessory to Apple Music. That would be such a shame, such a waste of good engineering. Well, there's one thing it can do is read you news. And in just a bit, we'll demonstrate that because, oh, iOS 11 point, what is it, 2.5 just came out. Yep. And uh, included in it, at least according to the description, compatibility with HomePod, and they've added that feature. So we'll do a little test in just a little <laughs> bit. Renee Ritchie from iMore.com, close personal friend of the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook. <laughs> no. Of Leo Laporte. Of Leo Laporte. And not nearly as exciting. Andy's not talking to me for 3.5 days. So after that, I'm going to be Andy's friend again. I'll be fine. I'll be fine after that. I'm not. This, 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 says more, this says more about me than it does about you. I'm, I'm acknowledging that. <laughs> Andy and I come from the Chicago Sun Times. Uh, our show today brought to you by WordPress, our sponsor and my blog host. I've been a WordPress user since day one, I think, pretty much, when Matt Mel Mullenweg announced his new platform for bloggers. I jumped right on it. I love WordPress. For years, I ran at my own WordPress blog on my own servers, which was pretty expensive. We had soft layer servers. I had to buy the server, and then it was time consuming because I was always tweaking it and fiddling with it and updating it. When I uh, discovered WordPress.com, and I'm ashamed to say it, I discovered it late in the day, I was so happy. WordPress.com is the same platform that runs 29% of the internet now, but easy. They, you, and by the way, much more affordable than doing it myself. They run the hosting. They keep it up to date. They keep it secure. They add the plugins and the templates. In fact, the business plan lets you access hundreds of plugins and themes. I turned on Google's AMP. Uh, speed up so that I my site runs faster on mobile. HTTPS automatic, automatic, just built right in. And and if there's ever a question or problem, those great WordPress experts are there, eager to help you. Twenty four hours a day, Monday through Friday, and on weekends too. I, they're just really, really great. I even I even said, all right, I'm looking for a template that does this and this and this. And they said, oh, you want 2017. And that's the template I'm using. I love WordPress. Whether you're looking to set up your own personal site, a blog, or you're a business and you need a site, this is the way to do it. Creating your website on WordPress.com helps others find you, remember you, and connect with you. 
You don't need experience. You do not need to hire somebody. WordPress.com guides you through the entire process from start to finish. Look at that. Let, as little as $4 a month. And just gorgeous templates. Easy. Built-in search engine optimization. Built-in social sharing. I love that because it means your fans or readers or customers can spread the word about your business or site or blog uh, by sharing it on their Facebook and Twitter. And I just, I just think it's so easy to use. You're going to want to try this. See why 29% of all the websites in the world run on WordPress. The best content management system out there, the best servers out there, the best support. And WordPress.com is a community. So I always, that follow button on your WordPress blog, that means more people will see you at WordPress.com. Get started today with 15% off any new plan purchase at WordPress.com slash MacBreak. Create your website, find the plan that's right for you, and then save 15% at WordPress.com slash MacBreak. So, Leo, I have some real-time follow-up. It was Nick Kiprios. I think that is his name from Hockey Night in Canada. Oh. That was with Tim Cook. <laughs> Hockey Night in Canada is huge. <laughs> it's our national anthem, sir. Yes. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, somebody in the chat room said Nick Kiprios. I wasn't sure if that was... Uh, yeah. Yep. So, uh, so, Nick got the interview. <laughs> well, he got to sit with Tim. I, the the interview is like we're we're all done earlier with I think like the real the real journalist type ah. people about the uh -huh. Malala. I, I'm going to pronounce the name wrong. I don't. I, Malala. I, Just say Malala. That's Malala. all you need to okay. say. Everybody knows Malala. So what okay. should I? Uh, so I've I've updated to eleven point two point five. What else is in here besides uh, HomeKit? Uh, I mean HomePod uh, integration. Is there anything it's a, else? It's a point five. So there's some minor updates, a, but yeah. it, the, the point three will be the next. So big what one. should I ask her? So the so the so thing to remember is that the news? Um, well yeah but you you want to you want to use Hey Shlomo for this because if you if you're looking at the screen oh. it's going to assume that you're looking at the screen and then it's going to oh. give you visual information oh so put it it's down it's when you're not looking at it that it's going to give oh. you yeah okay hey Siri what's the news here's the latest news from NPR or if you prefer say Hey Siri switch to Fox News switch to CNN. Or switch to Washington That's nice Post integrations. Instead. So you can switch which you want to hear. It's going to play me NPR. Live NPR News in Washington. I'm Lakshmi Singh. The governor of Kentucky so that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. Hey Siri, switch to Fox News. No, oh, I guess I can't. Switch to Fox News. And then, and then it also, and I like this. Has a, this is really good for us. Has a button that says Open Podcasts. Yeah. Now playing, you swipe up to access sleep timer. So there's more stuff underneath here and share. So that is, uh, that's fantastic. I think that's nice You can just pull that down and see all the other podcasts. So, ah, looks like uh, iOS Today, Tech News Today, Twitch. Good selections, Leo. Oh, that's, that's my shows. <laughs> that's not, that's not Siri's suggestions. That's really great. Unless Siri knows you very well. Yeah. Boy, you must really like that Leo guy. <laughs> so um, that's really cool. I, um, I like that. So that's. What is the syntax? I love it that you can't be looking at it because we tried well, it on so iOS they, today boy. and it was pulling up websites. Yeah, so it, it, there's a, they've been doing this for a long time. Like CarPlay has is a different verbosity level for a Siri. So if it knows that you're not looking at the screen, for example, uh, it, for CarPlay, it's going to assume you're not you're not staring at the screen because you should be driving. It's going to ramp up the verbosity and give you more vocal results. If it thinks you are looking at the screen, for example, you press the button, then it's it, it's pretty sure. And especially now with the newer iPhones, they can read attention. It's going to give you visual results because it believes that's more efficient for you to parse the data. So it, it sort of goes through that scale now and it's uh the U the u.s the uk and australia i think so far for the news feature and you have a variety of channels that you can choose from in each of those regions cool cool uh is is the battery stuff that tim cook alluded to the uh switch that can turn off the battery optimization i believe that'll be 11 point sorry 11.3 so i don't i don't believe that's in this one i'm okay. running the beta at least still and it's not in there okay uh, is it, it? We've already mitigated for Spectre and Meltdown, I think, so it won't be. And we that. dodged a bullet. It turned out because Apple did not use Intel's microcode. It did not believe that it could test or trust it, oh. uh, so it did not apply it. It applied the WebKit and Safari mitigations instead, and it turns out that was good because now Intel has said, "Wait, wait, no, no, we're killing older processors. Well, oh, not killing. They're causing them to reboot." So they said, "Please don't apply those." And Apple, you like, believe it? Didn't. Can we did you it. believe that? Jeez, Louise. Unbelievable. Yeah. Linus Torvald was not happy. Yeah. Yeah. He <laughs> hasn't been happy about this whole thing all along. And then 
he's really mad that Intel was pushing their, I guess he called garbage. it garbage <laughs> updates. Uh, I presume it also fixes the minor chaos or chaos message bug. The, uh, yeah, complete and utter garbage. That's what Linus yeah. called those patches. Um, that this is the the there was a GitHub page that had some code that if you sent the yeah. link uh, to uh, iOS or or Mac OS on messages, it would crash messages. And this is not the first time. I mean, there's there is something really weird about Unicode on a wide range of devices that oh, parsing it it's used to always have. Yeah. Like it was Russian for a while, and then it was it was emoji non-break spaces once, and this is like the third or fourth time we've seen uh, text parsing cause uh, crash or freeze bugs. So. I can show uh, now the Cheesecake UFO uh, tweet because uh, the link has been disabled. But it, w it was weird that you could literally just send a link, a GitHub link, and that would freeze or crash the device. Well, once it was Arabic characters, once it was Cyrillic characters, and it's just something about how it reparses those characters. It parses those characters that caused it to yeah, loop. Yeah. Uh, okay. But fixed, uh, I presume, in 11.2.5, yep. Apple said it would uh, do that. Uh, do we? Do we? I mean, I know it just came out, so you haven't had time to to look at it. Well, my problem is that I'm running the beta, and I came here right from the airport, so I only have one phone with me, and I, so I can't read the notes that they put <laughs> in the release version. Uh, let's see. Addresses an issue that could cause the iPhone app to display incomplete information in the call list. Fixes an issue that causes mail notifications from some Exchange accounts to disappear from the lock screen. Addresses an issue that could cause message conversations to temporarily be listed out of order. Fixes an issue in CarPlay where now playing controls become unresponsive after multiple track changes. This is an interesting one. Adds ability for voiceover to announce playback destinations and AirPod battery level. So that's for that's an accessibility feature that allows people yeah, absolutely. to hear what's going on instead of see. That's nice. And uh, hey Siri, play the news is the new command. You can yeah. oh. There you go. And there it goes. <laughs> but what I like about Siri in general is, yeah, it, it absolutely is more limited, but it provides a variety of syntaxes. So you don't have to specifically say the right words in the right orders. Uh, you can say a variety of things like uh, send app, uh, send out, um, yeah, send and WhatsApp, WhatsApp, and like yep. you can mix the words up and it'll still understand them. So it won't work if I just press the button and say, "Let's hear some technology news." Sorry, I don't think it does technology yet. It doesn't do technology. No, it just does. Let's hear some hockey news. Oh, it does. Of course. To the view from the penalty box podcast with Cam Connor. Cam, there you go. Cam Connors, a name you can trust for hockey news. So, Siri, if you're looking for some source, I don't know, of technology news, I'm just saying there there must be podcasts somewhere. Cam Connors, Leo Laporte, they're both like Stan Lee, 1960s superhero civilian names, yes. alliterative. Just saying. I'm not Pro Peter Parker, ve but... Very, very easy to code up as as hot words because they... <laughs> la la. Big, like la la. <laughs> I'm sorry. We fair, don't have fair. any technology news. All we could find is that stupid Leo Laporte guy. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, that's interesting. I can actually ask it for hockey news. That is really good. And yeah. I love it that it's playing the podcast. I think that's really interesting. And they added golf and tennis last week as well. Nice. Not for news, but just for scores and, and a bunch of other stuff. Does, does golf have usually... scores? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> you, 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 What's the score of the score? big golf game this weekend? Well, you know, Tiger Woods is three under. Three under par. Bogey, Hawkeye bogey for the Avengers shot, shot 18, scored 18. Double so eagle was... bogey on the fourth hole. And... All right. <laughs> um, no Spotify. Any plans to add Spotify? They don't typically announce stuff until they've done it, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it, 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 again, it's such an obvious thing to add hooks to Siri everywhere for yeah. audio. You, yeah. Would it? Would... I, I would... Would it be up to Spotify uh, I, to use it to do Siri Kit? Or? They would provide the Siri Kit extension, and then Spotify would implement it on okay. their side. Yeah, it's I, I don't I, I'm not even for Spotify. I don't I'm not sure if they would add an implementation specifically for Spotify when they could uh, take that much uh, time and trouble to create an API so that you could put any audio hook onto it and basically shove the responsibility for how to implement it uh, even further onto the service. Uh, just just the idea of you know, play the news. 
how do you know that they're saying, I want to hear an NPR's newscast versus I want to hear a Huey Lewis track? And how do you want to, even uh, on uh, uh, Google Music versus uh, Apple Music, the same request will get different responses sometimes depending on quirks of the database. Hey, Siri, so, listen to Mac Break Weekly. Let's see if it does that. I'm not looking. Sorry, I couldn't find Mac Break Weekly. MP3. I play. <sighs> no, it got more stuff, actually. Okay. Hey, I'm not going to look at it. Hey, Siri, listen to Mac Break Weekly. Playing podcast Mac Break Weekly. MP3. Nice. So Very nice. It will, Mac yeah. Break Weekly. It will, we don't need to do the show, Leo. You can just have Siri do it every yeah, week. Yeah, I'm just... <laughs> And now, how do I stop it? <laughs> hey, Siri, Something stop. Our listeners ask themselves every day. <laughs> stop. Yeah, Apple, I, I, I feel good about Apple's uh, maturing of, uh, of HomePod particularly. They've been very, very good about making sure that they extend and embrace when they feel as though they can handle it or when they feel the time is right. So I'm disappointed that it doesn't do, excuse me, as far as we know, it doesn't do more uh, at launch, but I'm sure that in a year it'll be where we hope it to be, and a year after that it'll start to support uh, more services and more platforms. You can pair it uh, to your phone, right, and use it as a speakerphone, right? Yep. Yeah, over AirPlay, it does have a Bluetooth radio, but there's no sign that it that Apple has surfaced yep. A2DP, or I forget what the letters are oh. for the new one. So how do you um, do AirPlay with a phone call? It's just an endpoint. Uh, it's oh, well, the well, speakerphone protocol yeah, 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 has probably yeah. been established, but I get it. So when you're in the call, you press and you say send yeah. that to the speaker, like you do with AirPods. Yeah. AirPlay and AirPlay is very high quality, right? AirPlay yeah. one is. Um, like it, it, it was never designed to be as far ranging as it was in eventually implemented. So that is why AirPlay two is so important. But for point to point stuff, AirPlay, especially for things like that, it's better than Bluetooth fine. anyway. <laughs> well, wouldn't be hard. <laughs> it's damning with faint praise. Yeah, that's damning with faint. Well, and good news, you can mute the microphone. Yes. I will now be singing, and I do not want the NSA to hear my voice, so yeah. please move. You, is, that, is that with a physical switch, or is that with a command? Unclear. Um, you know, the only I reason... I think it's both. There are, it's let's check. see. Apple details HomePod's gesture controls. All right, let's see what this uh, has to say about that. Wow, I hate this when this happens. This is why, kids, you really shouldn't buy a Windows machine. <laughs> This is uh, this particularly is, if you have epilepsy. Yeah, wow. Well, it's like the Apple TV. Like, I love the idea that there's a physical switch that I have to push before it li listens to me. But every time I have to actually push that physical switch, I wish I didn't have to push that physical switch. Yeah. Uh, there are gestures. There we go. Carson's going to show it to me. What are the gestures? There's a plus and minus. Tap, triple tap, tap and hold, double tap, touch and hold. Tap or hold minus. Okay. Yeah, oh, I get it. Volume, plus, plus, plus or minus. Yeah, 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 yeah. So triple tap is previous track. Single tap is play pause. Double tap is next track. Triple tap is previous. I don't see the microphone off on thing. Uh, did there look like there was a button? Uh, so someone went into the code. There was new firmware landed, and there was a bunch of um, icons. There's icons for it, yeah. Yeah, and there's an icon for it. So um, we'll have to see. And the iconography was so interesting. As someone pointed out, it's the same. I think Ben Mayo from 9 to 5 Mac said it's the same iconography that Apple used in the Home app, but it's way more whimsical and fun than Apple's standard stuff. It looks almost like the WWDC posters where it's looser and more freeform and more abstract. And I, I, that must be intentional to sort of make Home and HomePod seem more welcoming, but it just it, it did not look like traditional Apple stuff to me. Very interesting. Well... I think we've talked as much about HomePod as we possibly, possibly could. Except Leo, silver or space gray, what are you getting? I like, uh, for devices like that, I, I kind of like them to be light colored, not dark colored. Yeah. But yeah, on the I, other I, hand, we have a lot of dark it's Echo, got a match your uh, iMac uh, Pro. Sonos stuff. I'm, I'm a, I'm a old fashioned hi-fi guy in the sense that I, all the speakers that like my parents always had <laughs> that had black cloth over them. And I think that makes me prefer black grills on oh, speakers. Interesting. Yeah. They, no because they don't impede the sound quite as much. 
Mm. Or, per, or or perhaps maybe 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 it's even better for when you're playing the soundtrack to Man of La Mancha and the Sound of Music. <laughs> All right, Apple is uh, it, now. I read somewhere that Apple's required by the new tax law to repatriate their two hundred sixty billion dollars held. My understanding is that they're not required to repatriate it, but they have to pay the tax whether they repatriate oh. it or not. And once you have to pay the tax, it makes zero well sense not to repatriate <laughs> yeah. it. Thirty-eight billion dollars. Billion. Billion dollars in taxes. Great. Uh, uh, Apple on Wednesday made a slew of announcements about its. Oh, yeah. These are the. This is so the a number of announcements. They're going to give every employee under the level of director uh, twenty-five hundred dollars in restricted stock units. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a that that's a three hundred million dollar gift because they have a hundred was it twenty thousand employees. Uh, Apple says they'll create twenty thousand new jobs with the money and build a new campus. Somebody told me it was going to be in Reno. That can't be right. Well, that's not a it's, campus. <laughs> yeah, it's it's well it's mostly tech support and training, so ah, they could really put, they could really put it center. almost anywhere. Okay. Also, it's also it might likely be a place where there is a really really uh, broad employment pool, and so people where people can live Reno pretty makes cheap, sense. which means that yeah yeah, and and so they don't have to pay them. I, I think I think Apple will pay anybody better than they, any other company would, but it's not going to be a ninety thousand dollar a year job. So they're going to want to live. They're going to want to put it someplace where people can live affordably. They're going to up the ante on the innovation fund, which really is just uh, money that they give to their partners. But I, but maybe it helps innovation. <laughs> Five billion instead of the one billion they announced last year. Um, the job creation will include direct deployment, but also suppliers. And I'm sorry to say they're going to include app developers in this, which they included in their <laughs> no. number before. They're yeah. too, you know, and that's not really people. That's working. baloney. Yeah. yeah. Uh, although app developers have been making money, uh, there's no question about that. But no, they'll still have hundreds lottery, of billions yeah. of dollars in cash. And I thought that uh, Horace Dediu's article on Asimco was probably, at least for my untutored brain, the best explanation of Apple Cash. Yeah. He calls it the Apple Cash FAQ. And what he says, which I didn't really g get before, is actually this isn't Apple's money. In effect, it's the shareholders' money. And there there is pressure for Apple to give it to the shareholders, either as dividends... But for tax reasons, that's not the optimal way to do it, or as buybacks. And so I think what will happen, Apple has uh, a lot of loans uh, on the books, $100 billion in loans. That's the money they borrowed against the international funds yes. to buy back stock. They'll pay those off first, I would imagine. Maybe not. It's all tax stuff, you know. And then at that point, maybe buy back more shares. But I didn't realize that actually is not an attempt to take it private. That's good for shareholders because it increases the, the value of ex yeah. existing shares. Reduces it, the pool of available. Yeah, right. Uh, so, um, and <laughs> yeah, it's a Q and A format. Things like, "Whoa, why would Apple need to take out loans? <laughs> Does it have problems with cash flow?" Quite the contrary, writes Horace. Apple's operating cash flow is eye watering. <laughs> Last year, it generated $63 billion. That's with a B from operations. The loans are not needed to operate. They're used to pay shareholders. Why does Apple need to pay shareholders? Because it's their money. Their money. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I thought you said this was Apple's cash. Apple is holding it for them. But if it has more than it needs, it's obligated to return it. I didn't really realize this, but then I'm no expert on corporate governance. But you're allowed, you know, most companies don't hold a lot of cash. You're allowed to spend that cash to make more money, you know, uh, to build assets, do R&D and stuff like that. But you can't just let it sit there. You're, you're supposed to, uh, you're supposed to, it's, a, it's considered a liability of all things on the, on the balance sheet. Um, so uh, there, well, in effect, it's an asset and there has to be a liability that grows in proportion to offset the asset. That liability is under shareholder equity. In other words, this belongs to the shareholders. So um, that's that's what will happen. Um, this is all complicated tax stuff. The other part further down about R&D I think is is super interesting and also how Apple buys or doesn't buy uh, or like makes acquisitions or does not make acquisitions. Oh, I, I, I thought, thought was this was very insightful. What about acquisitions? Why not buy other companies? 
Well, it buys companies, but usually small ones, which are essentially acquisitions of teams and their intellectual property. This is the one that I think is such a good thing for us to, to remember. Apple does not buy business models or customers or cash flows. And that's usually what you buy a company for. The business model, its customers, or its cash flow. Apple doesn't need any of that. Also, because Apple has a strong culture and wishes to preserve it, they're careful because acquisitions dilute culture. When we talked about buying Disney, there's more Disney employees than Apple employees. That's going to change the culture. And he says this is why integrations uh, often fail. And that makes a lot of sense. AOL Time Warner. <laughs> HP Compact. <laughs> because if you get a big company, that, that's going to change your company. Statistically, large acquisitions are value destructive. And the larger they are, the more likely they are to fail. Incidentally, when a company is acquired with cash, that hole in the balance sheet is filled with something called goodwill, which reflects some intangible value of the new asset. If and when the acquisition is deemed to have failed, you have to write off the goodwill. And in other words, rob shareholders of the cash they should have had. So I thought as we're looking at like Nokia being bought by Microsoft yeah. or AOL yeah. being bought by Time Warner. $30 billion uh, in a write-off for Microsoft because it yeah. didn't work. Google buying Motorola. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So let me let me find the R&D uh, stuff, too. Because, it was right above. Yeah. So why doesn't the company spend money on other things? You said they return what they can't use. Well, why can't they use it? Well, the company considers its mission to be very narrow. Add value. I love this. This is, it's Horace, you're great. Add value in specific areas where they can create tremendous value uniquely and under conditions they can control. Boy, Apple does that in spades, right? <laughs> Many such products don't require capital. Manufacturing, data centers, Apple stores require capital, R&D and sales not so much. Creating products is very cash efficient. In other words, Apple's existing cash flow is more than sufficient to well, create. And their existing talent, like the people who made the iPhone were drawn in large, like there were some new people like radio engineers and, you know, who were specific to the technology needed to make a phone. But most of them were people that were working on existing Apple products from the industrial design team to the hardware engineering team to the software team. All of those people were already employed by Apple. So the, the yeah. research and development required for iPhone, it was just a retasking of their time. Yeah, that's that's often why you'll find that some lesser uh, second tier products are delayed because it became an all, all hands on deck thing to get another product out the door or another piece of software out the door or a certain talent pool was robbed internally. Their biggest investment, I think, is really in personnel and in talent because they feel as though uh, once they get once they get someone really into the Apple system internally, once they have an employee or, or an engineer who's really into the Apple system, a lot of them really want to stay in that system. And they, they, they not only understand their area of engineering, but they also understand how Apple likes to articulate that kind of technology. Yeah. So that's where that's where they like to put their that's, money. I think. That's exactly what Ross says is that the, the expense of developing something like the iPhone is primarily salaries, paying the yeah. people you already have to do the job. So this was, I thought, very, very, uh, very useful. Uh, and it's, it's brilliant, too, because when you look at it, like a lot of times, it's really easy to write a blog post saying Apple should buy Netflix or Nintendo yeah, or yeah. whatever well, company. But them. when Apple does make these purchases, like Authentic led to Touch ID and right. PrimeSense and Siri and the purchases that they made and the technology that gave and the differentiation they're able to bring to their product, which is what Apple really wants. They want differentiated experiences that they, they think will provide value to the customers or will increase the value of the current products. Um, it, it's just those are the sort of flagship features you hear Apple announce year after year, and they come largely from those small acquisitions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We we think back to the acquisition of Beats, and this what did not become a thing where Beats was remained as the company that they were. Uh, only they're simply owned by Apple. They didn't become like the makers of FileMaker. Uh, they really, uh, it really was an acquisition of Jimmy Iovine, Dr. Dre, getting Apple Music to from a, from zero to where it is today, which is a strong, strong, not only a strong financial competitor but an influential competitor. Uh, the Beats brand of headphones. It was not allowed to contaminate anything that Apple was doing, while it also allowed Apple to. Uh, add a very, very compelling and important brand to the Apple retail stores, which is far more important than whatever profits they're getting from the hardware itself, and also being able to insert uh, Apple technology into this most influential, most important cultural brand. So, yeah, all, I mean, all this is really on the money. It's really, it's, uh, it's the usual way of trying to 
wrap your head around how much of how much capital Apple can throw around by trying to decide now. If we're trying to, if we're trying to, so the real estate of entire states, Rhode Island definitely, Delaware probably as well as <laughs> Delaware, but the, but buying Netflix, buying Disney, uh, buying these kind of properties, those aren't things. Those aren't things that Apple would ever want to do unless it can solve a problem for Apple, as opposed to allow them to be able to cover more territories on that big risk uh, playboard. <laughs> they, they're really not interested in just simply covering more territories. They're basically all, all power is about the ability to determine your own future and your own destiny. And everything Apple does as a very, very smart company is to make sure that everything they do allows them to continue to pursue their own destiny. So I think that if they were to do any more acquisitions or any more uh, infusions of talent, it would be to continue the idea of let's try to build our own own CPUs for everything and never have to take something off the shelf, never be uh, beholden to the schedule of Intel or any other company, never be beholden to the, let's char charitably call it functional quirks of certain Intel CPUs over the past 20 years or other makers. I think that that's the sort of thing that Apple would want to get into. And it's really interesting when you look at that list when it says, like, for example, uh, business models. Apple already has a very good direct-to-consumer business model, and they've been building the subscription model in, enhanced by Beats, obviously. But when you look at customers, if you, if you buy those companies, are those customers already Apple customers? Apple has a billion-odd customers already. Would it really be getting new ones? And the cash flow is the opposite of the problem that Apple needs to solve. It doesn't need to buy companies to make even more money or just to sort of get liquidity. So um, it's unclear what value those things would bring. Other than spend I, the money that they have. <laughs> I love, uh, so if you wanted to, you know, if you were wondering how good is Apple, uh, Fortune Magazine went out and queried thousands of executives, uh, asked them to rate enterprises in their own industry on investment value, quality of management, products, social responsibility, ability to attract talent. Number one, most admired company in the country, in the world, well, of course, Apple. Then Amazon, Alphabet, Berkshire Hathaway, Starbucks, Walt Disney, Microsoft, Southwest Airlines, FedEx, and J.P. Morgan Chase. So you don't have to trust us. Uh, clearly, uh, clearly, the biggest uh, executives in the country also agree Apple is well run. Um, let's take a break, and when we come back, we will talk a little bit more about uh, Apple. There's lots more to say. Oh, I'm just posing for a picture. You don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I thought you were replacing us. Fine. <laughs> fine. Fine. <laughs> Re <laughs> Renee's meeting Tim Cook, and Leo's so popular, he has to take fan photos in the middle of the show. I'm here with, They're my, leaving. with my generic They're leaving. bottle of water. They're leaving. They're walking out on us. I I'm thought. wearing a cardboard belt. <laughs> <laughs> he is not posing. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Carson stayed on the screenshot as long as he could, hoping to get get them out of here before uh, we... But then I said, oh, let's do an ad. It's nothing he could do about it. He did his, You did your best, Carson. I appreciate it. To save us from ourselves. Yes. Uh, our show today brought to you by FreshBooks. I would, take, I would pose for a selfie with these FreshBooks guys. They are great. I've known them since I started using FreshBooks in 2004. Now 10 million other people use FreshBooks because it's the best way to keep track of how your business is doing. To send out, it started by sending out invoices, sending out professional looking invoices with that, which is really nice. Big pay me button right on the invoice so you can, without doing anything on your part except credit card payments from your clients, that means they pay on average twice as fast. But that's not the whole story because it turns out once you do ex expenses and invoices through FreshBooks, you know your account's receivable, you know your account's paid, you know your expenses, you know how your business is doing, you know your profit, and you're ready for tax time. FreshBooks essentially is cloud accounting software, but don't say that out loud because people say, oh, I don't, can't do the cloud accounting. No, you don't have to do anything. Just, just, just use FreshBooks to send out invoices and their intuitive dashboard will tell you your spending, your outstanding balances, your total profit, all the balance sheets that you need. You'll know how you're doing at any given moment. And as a freelancer, that was always a big question mark. Am I making money at this? this is, you just don't know until tax time. Now you'll know all year long. And by the way, the best way to, to get your clients to pay. No more chasing clients for payments. 
You don't have to take a check to the bank and wait in line. You can get credit card payments right from the invoice. You'll always know exactly which invoices have been sent, which invoices have been paid, which are unpaid and overdue. And you even know which invoices have been viewed, which is very handy. They're always adding features. It's a it's a web app. So that means when you go to FreshBooks, you're you're seeing all the new stuff automatically. Like for instance, they just added the ability to create proposals in FreshBooks. Rich text, content, images, customizable sections. Showcase the value you bring prospective clients. Win more jobs. And then, boom, they're already in the system when it comes time to send them the invoice. Know what you did, when you did it. You'll never leave money on the table again. FreshBooks makes it easy to bill for time. They have a time and hours button right there on the website or on the app. They have great, by the way, iOS apps and uh, Android apps. You could bill by client. You could bill by project. Have different rates for every service. Put your business on autopilot from payment reminders to late fees. Automate as much or as little as you'd like and get back to doing what you love. FreshBooks is awesome. Make 2018 your most productive year yet and never fear tax time again. Try FreshBooks free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash MacBreak. Do us a favor when they ask, how did you hear about us? Just say, I heard it on MacBreak Weekly. Freshbooks.com slash MacBreak. This is very exciting news. I don't know if it's true or not. Uh -oh. Jeremy, uh oh, <laughs> Jeremy Horowitz writing in Venture Beat. Apple. This is actually he's re-reporting from Digitimes. Are you less excited now, Leo? No, they sometimes <laughs> okay. get it okay. wrong. But reportedly ordering touch panels for a new 13-inch entry-level MacBook. Be still my beating heart. Do you think? Is it credible? Digitime says Taiwan's General Interface Solutions, GIS, already supplies iPhone 10 3D touch panels and became an LCD module supplier for the MacBook laptop late last year. They already ship 300,000 laptop panels a month. Expect to double that number by the end of the year. And thanks in part to new MacBook orders. It's a touch panel manufacturer. It doesn't mean that Mac OS will be a touch pad. Uh, doesn't if, mean they ordered touch yeah. panels either. Yeah, I mean, exactly. they ordered non-touch already from them, right? Yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's, that's so, so many things. It's link I, I fell for it. Well, I mean, it's uh, if, if, if it renews the conversation about putting touch on Mac OS, that's interesting. I mean, but it's, it's so far in the future today from anything that... I can only speak for myself of anything that I'm aware of, and yeah. I will also I will also protect that by saying that it's not as though I'm I'm you know attending hockey games with the CEO. My my sources are not that good, but if a project were far along that they were actually ordering in quantity, uh, I mean this is the sort of thing where uh, <laughs> where, the, where the next WWDC would all be about Mac multi touch. That's what the, the entire show would be about. We would we would see the we would see the preview of the schedule, and every single box would be like empty purple on the schedule. It's like to be <laughs> topic to be announced, to be announced. Yeah. That's when you that's when you know that multi touch is coming to the Mac. Before then, I mean, it would be inter it would be uh, if we uh, if we play the game of assuming that this is actually good Intel. It would be an interesting move because I really don't think that uh, that the touch bar has made any kind of a cultural impact on the Mac community to make sure that the the basic Toyota Tercel level MacBook has the touch bar would really inc would uh, certainly uh, compel a lot of developers to think about ways to support it, if only to make the MacBook more fun and make their apps more interesting. So I don't think that would be a silly idea for Apple to pursue, but I'll even that I will believe it when I see it. I love the conversation, though. I mean, because there's so many possibilities here. One, like the the boring Occam's Razor one, is that they still haven't managed to get the 12-inch MacBook price down to where they need it to be, which is $99. Right. Apple has to have a $99 computer. So this could just be the next $99 computer because of MacBook Air. $999. I know our yeah, American currency yeah. is confusing. But. 900, sorry, $999. If, if, uh, or it could I'm not, be, I'm not, I'm not talking about the special price list for people who are friends with Tim Cook. <laughs> Can we please stop talking about your relationship with Tim Cook for one minute? Um, and, no, totally. And uh, I mean, at the other opposite ends, you have a MacBook that could conceivably have touch, although how that would be implemented would be interesting given how long it took 
Microsoft to retrofit touch onto Windows. And also Apple, as far as I know, has had MacBook. Like we got the Mac, we got the iPad Pro, but could have just have easily have been a clamshell. So is it more interesting to add multi-touch to the Mac or to add trackpad support to iOS and have a clamshell iOS device? There's all these like that's what I love about right now is that it's so it's far enough away that possible. we can just yes. imagine. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I would I love to see a new I MacBook. I, I don't know if it, adding a touch bar would make a MacBook more compelling for me, but okay. Um, I would a touch screen. Do I they have touch ID or does face does face ID take touch over ID would be good or ID face ID? ID yeah. yeah. Uh, I I would like to see an updated MacBook. I'd like to see a better keyboard. Um, the MacBook is a, is a really great product. Um, but we're never. I don't think we're ever going to see a touch uh, Mac OS. That's that's. I think well, it's just, I, I, I mean, agree it's, with that. That's I think crazy. that so I think we're more. Think yeah, I, I I find it a lot easier to I to imagine Apple evolving the iPad into something that's more like a notebook with a touch with a uh, with a trackpad with a clamshell design like like Renee said, than I imagine Apple wanting to re-engineer the Mac OS for uh, for multi-touch when Apple when when Microsoft added multi-touch to Windows. They did it brilliantly. They did. They they stumbled for, the, for maybe with the first it's iteration, but they came desert. up finally with a model that was wonderful. And I think that is kind of an example of how well you can have a, 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 a single screen that will adapt to whatever use case that you personally want to uh, want to do with it. But that took so much time and so much money. And that's the sort of thing you would do when your business is micro is is a desktop operating system. I don't think Apple sees itself in the desktop operating system business. I think they would see it as here. We found this way to make our our steam trains run so much faster, require so much less coal. I think they would see that as a dead end. I think they were more they would put they want to put more uh, of their money into developing uh, into developing their aircraft than into their steam trains right now. And so that's why yes. I see them evolving the iPad as opposed to uh, bringing the Mac into 2016. I, I'm it's also, also what interested we about before. Go ahead. Was so what we talked about before, where like you, Apple has these resources and they can move them around, but it comes at a cost. And if you were to task engineers to make macOS touch friendly, those engineers would come from somewhere. You'd, you you can't just add, there's a limit to how many engineers are willing to work in Cupertino for what Apple pays and like in, in that environment and all those things who have the technology, the ability to do this kind of stuff well and quickly. And Apple, like Microsoft, didn't really have a super successful mobile operating system, or maybe there would have been a very different game. Maybe they would have yeah. scaled that up too. Apple has a super successful touch first operating system. Um, so spending uh, the time and the money to make a second touch operating system, it's probably not the best use of those resources. But exactly what Andy said, instead of uh, the, on the on the on the smaller end, at least at first, it's really interesting to think about what an iPad Pro would be if it wasn't a clamshell with a trackpad. I think and, and I think yeah. that would answer uh, the, that would solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. They've got to be working point, on it. I'm sorry. More, I'm sorry. Just quickly, more more to the point. I think that Apple can really strongly compete with Windows notebooks if they make iPads that compete with them. I don't think they can compete with Windows notebooks the way that people buy Windows notebooks uh, by trying to make MacBooks. And by that, I, by that I mean, here's a thousand dollars. What can I buy? Uh, can I buy a really well built, practical, functional, durable? Uh, and useful notebook with a lot of memory and a lot of storage for that. Well, no, you can buy this. You can buy the version without air conditioning or a or, <laughs> or an AM FM radio. You and it will, but it will run Mac software. But but if you say here's a thousand dollars, it doesn't necessarily have to be a laptop computer. Oh my God! Here is a really incredible uh, a mid-sized iPad. Here is a wonderful keyboard cover plus an amazing Bluetooth keyboard you can have for it, and you can have a stylus with it, and then. It, but it doesn't run Windows. Yes, but it will run many of your Windows apps as iOS apps, and they look lovely. And they'll maybe maybe there's something better than Windows. And then after a week, people say, "Well, I guess there is something better than Windows. It's called iOS." And what? God, it could run an it could run an Apple A12 processor instead of a Core M processor, which I'm so over. <laughs> What uh, what do you think the new iPad? Uh, there'll be a new. They've got to be working on a new iPad for this year, right? The iPad schedule is. I mean, like they did six months between the iPad three and the iPad four, which granted, I don't think they'd ever do again. No, that was that just was they needed terrible. to replace that chip. Yeah. But they've also gone not you know eighteen months between refreshes instead of twelve yeah. months. So. I'm glad. I'm glad to see that. I, I think the. I think the annual iPhone refresh is kind of killing them. Uh, um, okay, that's a, that's obviously going too far. I mean, I think that uh, I think that it's, it puts a lot of pressure on them that they don't need, uh, and I don't think it necessarily results in bad products. But I think that it means that 
uh, it, it results in things like uh, a conversation I had with somebody just two days ago. Uh, even he, uh, she had bought a, an iPhone uh, iPhone X, and she returned it within a week because she loved the Face ID. But other than that, she didn't feel as though it was such a big upgrade over their his her uh, iPhone Seven Plus to justify a thousand bucks. Whereas if you weren't if they weren't putting out something every single year, every September like clockwork, and if they weren't in this horrible toxic culture where as soon as they announce that they're not coming out with a new iPhone this year, everybody. OK, including me <laughs> would be like, oh, my God, what does this mean? They're not doing an iPhone this year. I think that if they were allowed to do this on an iPad schedule where they know exactly the net what they, they basically have a list of here's what the next level for each uh, each level of progress is going to be. We think we can ship the next level of progress in 16 months as opposed to 12 months. Take the 16 months and do it that way. I, I would love to see that happen. <sighs> I want a new I'm a, I, I, iPad Pro. I want one with <laughs> face recognition. I want you know, one with a bezel-less almost. Well, I guess you can't have it. Well, yeah, I got I got I got to tell you though years. that you know the thousand bucks I spent for my iPad Pro at release, uh, the first generation. That is one of the best investments I've ever made in terms of using it every i still use it every single day and it still feels like a as fast and as wonderful as it did uh, when i first bought it and it still does really everything that uh, anytime i come across a new piece of software that i want to use it does everything that that new piece of software could do it's it's a really good uh, practical investment it doesn't need i i've never felt an incredible amount of envy over uh, over a iPad that came out two years after the one that I've bought, uh, whereas the number of times where I've thought, oh, I'm really sorry I bought a phone this year because the new one has <laughs> two cameras and the oh good oh look at that oh damn it why didn't I and wait another year? To two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's and the whole the NFL by the sorry, the NHL by the way, the bench was using iPad Pro. I think the twelve point nine ones last oh. night you could see them. Yeah. Oh. Not hobbled <laughs> by the NFL's deal to only use crappy Microsoft Surface tablets, eh? Uh yeah, I would rather have an iPad Pro on my bench. And some Tim Hortons. My uh, the iMac Pro, the gift that keeps on giving, Robert Morgan, mad scientist at bare feet has determined that it is, first of all, that it is possible to get an external Thunderbolt 3 storage device that is as fast as the amazingly fast internal T3. He got roughly the same uh, read and write speeds I was able to get on my iMac Isn't Pro. amazing? Three gigabit, a little more than three gigabytes per second write, and same problem I had, which is that the reads were two and a half gigabytes. Have we ever figured out why? Nope. Uh, I don't understand. This is the only system I've ever heard of where <laughs> as writing to their SSD is actually faster than reading it. But at Apple, and significantly faster, but somehow Apple's done it. But one of the things that they determined, trying to set this up, was that the uh, the new iMac Pro has dual Thunderbolt control controllers for the four Thunderbolt ports. So you can, this is crazy talk, use two of the ports, each on a different controller, to stripe different boxes and break the speed barrier to get to, get this, 4.781 gigabyte per second reads. How you like that, LaPont? <laughs> what the what now it's gonna cost you but if you bought an yeah. imac pro you don't care about price. yeah exactly uh there are a number it's only of, it's only a few alex's a number of units though they were able to do this with a kiddio makes uh these external thunderbolt 3 devices nodes they have but you have to buy two of them right and stripe them or the other world computing's thunderblade v4s and again you have to put them on two of them on two different thunderbolt 3 boards yeah. <laughs> how do they stripe i don't i guess that's an apfs feature where you could have multiple I, discs striped on different boards. i don't know i saw the numbers and my jaw dropped i didn't have time to read the article <laughs> yep don't, don't you love what these these benchmarks where you I, you really i really do have to get out the spreadsheet and do the math and convert it to something i know about yeah, to figure out that numbers this big i just look at the decimal like am i really is a decimal point really where i think it is <laughs> right 4791 megabytes 
per second. That's four point. And, th and then try to translate that gigabytes. into like how, how many K video could that handle <laughs> for, as, a, as a durable right speed? All of it. All, all of it. <laughs> exactly. It's like it's like sun, the 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 street, <laughs> the, the view outside my window. I just want to try that. I just wanted to put oh, that big God. 8K camp on that and just see, <laughs> see the throughput. Oh God! Yeah, I I, be, I believe what a, what the performance of a machine like this, when Marquez Brownlee does a demo and tries to make or Vincent, it cry, Vincent if she can, puts the weapon, the, the red weapon on it, yeah. and it goes live. <laughs> Facebook Live with Vincent. Or a. Good Just news is fill, this, we this, fill the room with popcorn with 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 styrofoam packaging peanuts and to, to put fans on it and shot 12k video of that <laughs> and tried to compress it. Here's here's what happened. The good news is the enclosure itself isn't that expensive. The Akidio uh, node. Light is two hundred sixty nine dollars, but then you have to put, you have to buy more stuff because you have to put uh, fast drives in it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you know, I might, I might pick one of these up. That's nice. PCIe just a couple expansion Alexes. chassis. Yeah, <laughs> just a couple of Alexes. Go. Not so bad. You'll, you'll, you'll make, we can make it as de facto pick of the week. Lifetime? I have to <laughs> say, uh, you know, I, I just the, the internal drive is so damn fast. Yeah. It's mind-boggling, but the fact that you could get something faster, even faster, externally on a Thunderbolt three is, well, just crazy. Yep. Yep. I can't. I really. I act. I actually can't wait for WWDC. I hope that the first ten-minute slot in the keynote is just going to be here's how people are using the iMac Pro, and I, they need it. I, I really want them to come up with tactical examples of here is exactly how people are using. We thought, and, and, and the engineers thought there's no way people are ever going to be able to max out these processors. Here's how people are maxing out these processors. And I really want to see practical demos of that because I, be I imagine it be, it's going to be jaw-dropping. It would be a 10-minute segment that they finish in one minute because it's so fast. <laughs> uh, just just incredible. Just incredible. Air Force um, One, done, done, yeah. done. I mean, yeah. it's, I mean the, the, I, the, more I, the more I learn about the iMac Pro week after week as people who have specific knowledge in memory channel uh, infrastructure and in data path infra infrastructure, as, as these people have, have, have now had a few weeks to really tear it apart and see what it can do and explain it to people like me who are not experts in that kind of engineering, the more you learn about the iMac Pro, the more impressed you get with it. This is one hell of a machine. And I'm kind of left wondering what happens when they build a boring metal box where they don't have to constrain things for airflow around a CRT, CRT, sorry, a, a video panel and, and other <laughs> things like that. What, what, if it just, when it, what if it just becomes here is a here is the box that my new pair of like Timberline, <laughs> Timberline boots, boots came in. You are to fill this with as much hammer of God processing power as you can. I want I want to be able to shift this thing. 10 seconds back in time with the amount of processing power in this and money is no object. Our, our users have proven money is no object when it comes to really fast max. Go to it. I feel as though we are going to bring in the destruction of the human race. This is going to be so good. I love John Gruber's takedown of the Newsweek article <laughs> <laughs> announcing that iPhone uh, X is such a poor seller that Apple's about <laughs> to cancel it. Uh, so I wasted half a day on that as well. Oh, it's such a great thank you, uh, John Gruber, for the line. And the uh, throw in some poor reading comprehension skills and sensationalist mendacity, and you get Anthony Cuthbertson's report for the publication that today operates under the once respected name Newsweek, saying that the iPhone tends a flop. It's not. It started with a report from uh, uh, Ming Chi Kuo at KGI Securities. That Apple, and again, rumor, 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 that Apple will probably not keep the iPhone 10 around after this year. Replace I mean, if only there was an example that we could look at. Have they the ever done that where, before? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if only like maybe the iPhone 5 that was retired <laughs> after a year yeah. because the 5S came out and the 5C was so much easier to manufacture and targeted a very specific market that Apple wanted to test out. Could it be that the iPhone 10 is 
is expensive to manufacture and uses scarce OLED resources. And Apple is going to save the OLED for their their flagship devices. And they're going to go to LED for this and maybe make it a little bit bigger. So it's more appealing to the Chinese market. And it'll be like an iPhone 5C, but like not really. But I mean, it'll be sort of that mentality. I mean, if only Pass could ever be prologue. We well, would also, also, also we, for, we forget that Apple, uh, another th- that's, uh, so many of things that a company can do that are really brilliant have nothing to do with engineering. They just simply have an idea of putting something a product in the proper context like with the iphone 10 they did not make that the iphone 8 they said here's something extra iphone 8 this is something above the iphone 8 this is something special we are not pretending that the best that we're not pretending that a mainstream phone from us is going to cost a thousand dollars we are going design riffic with this one we're putting so many really cool ideas we wanted to put into phones into this thing this is not this is not the phone of 2017 this is the phone of 2020 uh, and so if you think that it's a silly thing, that's fine. You still have the iPhone 8, which is a wonderful incremental upgrade over the iPhone 7. It also gives them the ability to, if someone is silly enough to call the iPhone, if uh, assuming they take, they stop making the iPhone 10 uh, in September, they it also gives them the very credible way to say, look, we didn't, <laughs> this is not necessarily going to be the new upgrade path for the iPhone. And guess what? We have the iPhone 9, which is, has face recognition, which has OL, uh, OLED that doesn't have the ears on it and now costs only $800 doesn't cost a thousand dollars plus they've already sold what eight uh, how many <laughs> 18 million was it the uh, they, the they might have sold so far yes For, yeah it's like so tell me tell me how this can in any way be explained to be a failure unless it's i've i've been there it's monday you're, you you all you all you got to do is file <laughs> something at the end of the day you got the thing the brilliant thing you've been spending three weeks three weeks on has has totally failed to pan out you got to file something or else you're going to miss dinner with your kids i get it and i think we uh have all agreed that this iphone 10 is the best iphone ever right yeah it's I one of the best products agree. apple's ever made you know, i yeah. i i well okay renee and i love the iphone 10 Andy, what do you I, think the best iPhone is? You prefer an eight, maybe, or um, I don't. The only way, the, the only reason why I don't think it's necessarily the best thing they've ever made is because of the price. I don't think the price is criminal. I just think that. Well, that's a good um, point. Yeah. One of the what it's it's uh, my again. This is just my opinion, and, and my opinion is biased and uh, and flawed, just like everybody else's is. Uh, my when I think about technology, I think of the one the one of the ways you remove the level of difficulty is to say, well, screw it. We're going to charge two hundred bucks more. We're going to charge twenty five percent more for this product than they did we did for the, our previous top product. That doesn't mean that product is bad. It just means that. You made things easier for yourself. I'm more I'm more impressed with uh, the Raspberry Pi, where they said, <laughs> "Here is a brilliant thirty-five dollar computer that has changed the world in ways that uh, you, you have to compare it to the iPhone. The way it's changed the world." And for their follow-up, they said, "We've decided that <laughs> thirty-five dollars is too much to to spend for, on a on a on a computer that runs a desktop operating system that could run a Microsoft Office compatible suite. We come up with a six dollar version of it. That is incredible. That blows my mind. Uh, so I I really." love the iPhone 10. It's kind of made me, uh, as much as I might have said about how I react to a thousand dollar iPhone uh, in the lead up to the iPhone 10, I kind of would like to see if they would say, let's, we're going to make a 14 or we're going to always have, a, a, again, an iPhone edition, just like the Apple Watch edition, where we are not even pretending this is a practical phone for most people. We are just simply saying, here's what we could, we're just saying to ourselves as we we are a design company first. We love the idea of if we could, all the times we said we can't put this component in or we can't put in this feature or we can't use this style of manufacturing or this style of or, uh, this, uh, this material for the case because it would drive the price up to $1,400. Well, we've discovered that we can sell 18 million units if we, uh, for $1,000, can we sell 12 million? million units of something that is absolutely the most gobsmackingly beautiful object you have ever put in your hands inside a shopping mall in your life. I'm interested to see how, what Apple would do that. There are very few companies that would be interested to see what they would do with it, but Apple is such an amazing design firm that I would love to see what they would do. I would never be able to afford it, but I'd love to see what they would do with it. Well, as just a daily user of the iPhone uh, 10, I have to say I, uh, I I couldn't be happier with it. There are, there are not. It's not perfect. If face ID doesn't work every time. I wish it did. 
but I can always enter a six digit code. It's, it's not aspirational the the though. That's the thing yeah. I like. That's why I like the Nexus one so much is that it felt like it was yeah. the future yeah. of, of phones. And I think this is like the, the Palm pre was like that for me the first time I saw it. And then the Nexus yeah. one, and there have been a few phones since then, but this is one of those phones where like I look at it and I go, yeah, you know, okay, I can see the phone I'm using yeah. next year and the year after yeah, that, you know, so. a break with the past has happened and yeah. it's, and it's, we're looking for it. And that now, and I think if you don't make the leap that Cuthbertson made for, link bait reasons in Newsweek, uh, you could you could trust, I think, Ming-Chi Kuo's, again, understanding it's very early in the year. We're talking about what's going to happen nine months from now. But you could, I think, given that he has his finger on the supply chain, probably these discussions are happening already. He knows the what. Like, he's 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 good. Uh, and there, people debate the, eth the ethics of what he does, but he's very good at getting um, supply chain information. Uh, he's very good at the what. He is often not great yeah, at the, the why because yeah. he's extrapolating. Right. And that's true with a lot of Apple rumors. Like people will hear something and then they'll make up a narrative because right. it either sounds yeah. good to them or something else, but it has nothing to do with the with the actual decisions going on behind that product. So it's he, a story, he's, but he's predicting uh, two iPhones at the end of the year, two <laughs> iPhones, whatever we'll call them, new iPhones. One lower cost, 6.1 inch uh, iPhone based on the iPhone 10, it'll have the notch, it, but it will be aluminum, not stainless steel. Uh, there'll be other, you know, compromises made to get it down below, well below the current one thousand dollar price point. He's saying seven or eight hundred dollars, and then there'll be a large, which is surprisingly large, high end six and a half inch uh, OLED version. So the, it's the, like the plus again. It's bringing back the plus, basically. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that and that's that's a common complaint I'm, I've been hearing of, with, with people that when I talk to people who bought an iPhone 10 and then returned it, they didn't hate it. They just said it didn't feel as big as my old plus. Uh, and you can go into well, let's compare exactly how much real estate you had for that. It just didn't give them whatever they were looking to get out right. of a large size phone emotionally. They weren't responding to it. I actually love the size of this and it, i understand it's smaller than the plus usable real estate yeah but i, I will miss if, it, it doesn't look like if this is the roadmap it's a good middle ground this phone it's a good middle ground and plus as uh, now that we would uh, it's one of the great <clears throat> things about apple products is when they do these changes like the touch bar and like the screen that has the ears to it that de there's only so much they can show you in the launch demo it, it's going to take like three months until three months after the thing is released when all the developers actually have actual hardware in their hands not simulators but hardware in their hands and now we're seeing people who are really using the ears in very interesting ways to make it look like we have this the, we have these two special extra tiny oled displays it feels like yes. that i'm going to that i'm going to put like a, a a histogram level for a camera which it seems like the most natural place to put a histogram level uh, on a camera uh, and so uh, it's uh, whereas uh, this is one of the, this is one thing that things that really prejudices my evaluation of uh, of something new that Apple or any other company puts in a product. It is it is now a year year and a half since the Touch Bar came out. I have yet to see any groundswell of apps that are using it effectively. Whereas there uh, every single week well, brings another ubiquitous. app. Where I'm thinking that it's the same well, thing. Not, yeah. not, well, it's not not only that, but the 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 ears aren't ubiquitous either. But the, 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 the my perception sure. is that it gave it gave the developers an idea of well, you know what, the histogram is something that it doesn't it really has to be easy to see, but I can't it can't be covering up the 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 live area of the screen. That's where I'll put that. Or here's where I'm going to put like just a little bit of a pip, just a little bit of a cue for someone to know that there's something happening in our app that we want you to take a look at. Whereas uh, it it uh, developers are really really creative and really really self driven. They're not necessarily if they if you uh, all developers buy whatever it is that Apple has that's brand new that has hardware that they're going to want to think about supporting. And when you see a developer who says, "I don't care if this increases my unit sales. I think it would be a really awesome idea to use the Touch Bar this way." They'll put it in, and then that will be a good demonstration of what it can do. I rarely see anything like that. I don't think the touch bar is inspiring developers the way that the ears have been inspiring developers. Yeah, and I like. I think that's really important too because some people labeled it a notch right away, and a notch feels like something taken away from you. But when you yep. look at all these these quote unquote edge to edge displays, all of them have some kind of bezel at the top, and what this does is cut away the two sides of the bezel, which is why I like ears. Right, I do the horns for Craig Federighi um, <laughs> because it's giving you something extra. It's almost like the extra space you have for complications or in the sides of a display. It's like peripheral information, and some people have put volume indicators there or sliders there or all these things that just they, they get them out of the main part of the interface face and you don't have to stare at them but they're there instantly when you need them and i think that's the sort of creative thing that's really great about them 
Mm. It'd be better if we didn't have it, of course, but we do have this extra <laughs> space, so put it to use. We should actually, we didn't really talk about the Malala Fund. We should probably uh, talk a little bit about that. You have a good article in I, on iMore, Renee. Apple becomes Malala Fund's first laureate partner, helps increase support for girls' education. Uh, this is why Tim Cook was in uh, Canada, right? Well, so he was flying back. He was in Lebanon to meet with her and to discuss what Apple's doing with the fund, which is making it uh, – they're giving them enough money to be able to expand it to a, a, a many, many, multiple, many more people. Um, and then on his way back from flying, he stopped off in, in Toronto for the code thing because right. he's super passionate about – and he actually revealed in a different interview that he didn't have the opportunity to learn you know, because of his generation. He didn't have the opportunity to learn code until he went to college. And he thinks that it's just so important for people to get access to that early on, which is why Apple's doing all these labs for kids and introducing them to Swift Playgrounds uh, and to other uh, – to other things, but the Mala Fund is amazing because it's gonna it's it's just about giving the opportunity for education to people who have historically been denied access to it, uh, it either it, any education at all or education beyond uh, K through six, and just making sure that everyone has the opportunity to have a free and a safe and a secure um, education so that they get off to the best possible start that they can. Uh, Cook uh, was speaking at Harlow College in Essex. Uh, this is uh, as uh, kind of their uh, talking about their everyone can code curriculum. And uh, he was asked if he believes there should be limits to the use of technology in schools. I don't believe in overuse. I'm not a person that says we've achieved success if you're using it all the time. I don't subscribe to that at all. I, I kind of agree with you, Tim. <laughs> uh, even in computer aided courses like graphics design, technology should not dominate. There are still concepts that you want to talk about and understand. And of course, on literature, do I think you should use technology a lot? Probably not. He says, I don't have a kid, but I have a nephew that I put some boundaries on. There are some things I won't allow. I don't want them on a social network. Is he raising his nephew? No, but I think he, like, it's sort of like me with my god kids where you spend a lot of time with them and you have okay. to make sure that you're yeah. consistent with what you want, with how they're being raised. Like, you can't have a separate set of rules from their parents. Yeah. And it's really, you know, Uncle Tim runs Apple. Yeah. So that kid could Uncle, conceivably have, Uncle Tim, yeah, should, uh, should Johnny now. be on a social network? No. <laughs> I think that yeah. those, those, those of us without kids but who have nieces and nephews, uncling is a very powerful and very, very responsible verb. It's like I realize that I get to parent this person for four to six hours hours one day every two or three weeks and i want to make sure that they i want to make sure that whatever they experience while i'm babysitting them while they're in my office playing with one of my macs while i'm working on, the, on their desk you you do want to give them something to chew on during the two weeks that they have to deal with life <laughs> and so i that's I, I i absolutely understood what he was talking about there he did say if i think if you had to make a choice it's more important to learn coding than a foreign language. I know people who disagree with me on that, and let's hope you don't yeah. have to make the choice. You could learn both. But coding is a global language. He's true about that, and it's the way you can converse with 7 billion people. I think, uh, I think no, both. I think it, I'd learn both. Uh, no, I think I, I, I don't think he said anything scandalous here, so it's nothing that makes me upset or angry. But I would say that you don't converse through code. You converse through apps that are built with code. Right. And then that's when you're going to, oh, I would, I would say that if, if I had to choose one or the other to that, uh, again, let's say, <laughs> let's say my, my niece or my nephew, who's nine years old said that my school, we can choose between, uh, one period, uh, one of our period classes can either be a programming course or we can learn American sign language. I would say, take the sign language course. Yeah. You will a, not only, not only will it be interesting for you to understand that there are different ways that people can, that people communicate with each other, but it also means that you will be of help in an environment where very few people speak a language. So yes, definitely you can you can learn C plus plus. There, there, you'll you'll have you'll have all of your teenage years for pain. Until then, broaden yourself. <laughs> yes. Uh, they asked him about the Paradise Papers. Of course, the revelation that many companies and and, and individuals were uh, sh sh storing money offshore. He said, I probably haven't read everything that's been written, so I wouldn't want to pass judgment on the Paradise Papers. But he does say the right way to address multinational national tax is a worldwide thing. Because if not, it becomes a tug of war between countries saying, I want this, I want that. You know, Apple took advantage of le completely legally of tax laws in the United States, but I'm glad to see them, them repatriating uh, the money. He said, we have a deep sense of responsibility to give back to our country and the people who make our success possible. And he said that in England, so I'm thinking, <laughs> I think he means it. 
<laughs> while surrounded by all the suitcases of cash <laughs> that he's going to be charging $50 a him. bag for. <laughs> yes, taking back with him. Uh, Apple is launching a new internal fitness challenge for employees. Oh, I love this. You get a unique Apple watch band. They do health challenges frequently. I think every year, if not multiple times a year. But the Apple Watch Band is is a nice. I would like add this to it. band. Are you going to be? Wouldn't it be awesome if they if they as part of the Apple Health app, when you meet fitness challenges, it basically deposits a little token in your iTunes account, so that when you go to the when you go to the Apple Store or go to the online Apple Store, there are bands you can only buy, just like like Boy Scout patches or Girl Scout patches, if you have earned the right to buy this band. So I it's a um, it's a one of the one of the hook and loops, right? The hick and loopers, a woven nylon sports, band. Yeah. Oh no, it's got a it's got the a woven buckle. nylon. Yeah. yeah, okay. It's solid black, but and I love this has an accent loop in a dark pink, red, uh, with lime green and light blue. The three colors, of course, that represent the activity rings. Yeah. And the way you get it, you have to reach a gold level. Uh, it's not clear exactly how you get the gold level of the activity ring. Certain, you have to fill your rings for a set number of days, I guess. You, you just have to outrace Jay Blonick. It's super simple. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I follow uh, Rene Ritchie on uh, activity, and he fills those rings in pretty uh, pretty consistently. I managed to do it last. I was just always joking because Jay Blonick reminds me of Steve of Captain America in the um, the Winter Soldier movie, where on your left, on your left, I just imagine Jay spends half his day doing laps around Apple Park. <laughs> that, that, that's a good way to get gold. I think this is. I think this is a great idea to you know encourage employees. It's a minor thing, but it's kind of a badge of honor. Encourage employees to stay fit. This is great. Uh, do you think? Do you think that the the design of the Apple campus is going to cause like pronation problems? Because <laughs> because it's, it's like NASCAR where they're only ever Everybody's making left turns sideways. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're at least going to have to like alternate them just to have the wear on the heels of their shoes. Well, it's a the ten same. minute walk from the from visitor center to campus, so to the to the ring. So I mean, they they got lots of room to work there. So uh, no word whether they'll ever sell this in public, but that would be pretty cool. They did give away uh, for Pride uh, in twenty sixteen. Yeah. They gave rainbow colored Apple watch bands to employees, which is also and they awesome. had a version of that that was available to the public. Eventually, later. they sold that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would rather see it though in the uh, hook and loop. I like the Velcro. I really do. Those that's the most comfortable watch band. It's the sweatpants of Apple. It's sweatpants it's of sweatpants. Apple watch bands. <laughs> and, but it doesn't look it, also, it doesn't look like sweatpants, right? Well, also it doesn't like you know, in the winter months when you suddenly use it doesn't it doesn't make it quite so obvious that wait a minute, I'm using like one one notch further on my yes. watch band. I'm yeah. actually getting I'm gaining weight in my wrist cuz it's winter <laughs> and I can't I don't want to run in 12 degree weather. Damn it. <laughs> Uh, there is, uh, let's see here. This is from Business Insider. Thank you, Scooter X. These are the bikes Apple designed yeah. <laughs> for the Apple uh, campus. Silver, silver bullet. They're silver. You know, Google's are rainbow colored. They don't look that much uh, different. Yeah. There's the Google uh, ones. But yeah. Can I, can, can, can I just make one really horrible wise guy comment? It's like, it's a bicycle yes you're out there having fun and in part like reliving your childhood but no we can't it must be gray it cannot have any cheerful colors no we're, we will not even let you have a bell on it bell <laughs> is bell not, is a joyful thing not even any brands on it they, there's no logos on the tires or anything most it's, apple office buildings so i mean it, it, in some ways it's a problem for them because anything any building with an apple logo is immediately where you go to get your iphone right. fixed even if it's an office building right and any bicycle with an apple logo is immediately something Good everyone point. throws in their truck the minute yeah. they see it yeah. because now i've stolen an apple bicycle yeah that's a that's even, actually even, a very Go good even point. google it's not it's not just that but google is having a problem losing their own google bikes not only because like they're kind of cool bikes but also because the community and Mountain View feels as though we're part of the Google community. It's, yeah. If we, if, even the mayor, if, if they're like the shopping carts where you, yes. know, you got groceries and you're, you're just going to like walk a mile or two home. And then maybe it'll be a couple of weeks before you bother singing it back or maybe you'll just toss it into a ravine. So I, I can't imagine how, how long it's going to take before some of these Apple bikes arrive on eBay because there are people who will want to add an Apple bike to their collection. Let's take a break and get your picks of the week in just a moment. Andy Anako, Chicago Sun Times from imore.com. 
Renee Ritchie, Tim Cook's new best friend, and <laughs> our picks of the week coming up in just a little again, bit. Again, in three and a half days, we will stop giving you crap for this. We, should, we shouldn't be giving you any crap at all. We've, got, we've just got some jealousy issues to We're work out. We're just jealous. That's all there We're is. Fine. That's all it, it is jealousy. Is. It's just, it, makes, it makes us look very ugly, but we just have to get through it to no, get past it. No, you're always beautiful all. to me, Andy. <laughs> hey, I was, just, uh, I was just looking at my molecule air uh, purifier on my smartphone and then i just thought wait a minute i've got one here i could show you yeah this is it this is the molecule we actually got one for the studio because the studio has problems with fumes you know when they tarred the roof it was really hard to breathe in here um uh, you know the the fires in uh, northern california made it very smoky in here they painted and the vocs in the air made it hard to breathe and uh, and and uh, fertilizer season in petaluma is coming up uh, real soon and well, you just don't want to be here when that's <laughs> happening. That's why we got a molecule. In fact, I've ordered another molecule for our house. We've had one in our bedroom, Lisa and I, for some months. In fact, Lisa says she had allergies. She would wake up every morning congested with a headache ever since we got the molecule. Never. It didn't happen. One day, I accidentally turned off the molecule. She said, what you do? I got a headache. I said, oh... So I got I got anecdotal proof positive the molecule works. You've probably uh, heard of uh, air purifiers that use HEPA filters, right? Uh, it's 50 years ago. That was the greatest thing ever developed in the 40s. There haven't been any innovations since, well, until that, until now. Molecule uses PICO technology, photoelectrochemical oxidation, that does a lot more than any HEPA filter does. See, HEPA filters are just filters they're sieves the, the they the, the pico filter does a whole lot more first of all it can capture pollutants 1000 times smaller than a hepa filter it also can eliminate allergens mold bacteria viruses and even vocs and air, other airborne chemicals so your air is great to breathe funded originally by the epa extensively tested by real people verified in university labs like the university of southern florida's center for biological defense and the university of minnesota's particle calibration lab i love our molecule you can pair it to the internet control it from your phone but you can also control it just as you would any filter uh, just from the top they've got a button on the top it has a silent mode which is great for the bedroom at night although i have to say even when it's on loud it's kind of a nice white noise. It's very soothing. Uh, I like how it masks noise. They also have a light that is the is breaking down these chemicals. You could turn that off at night, but you want to turn it on again in the morning because it actually it's cleaning the air. I thought I said, oh, that's just a light to let you know it's working. They said, no, 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 that's the that's the 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 um, it must be ultraviolet light that's breaking down the chemicals. So it has a. Um, a filter that is actually uh, capturing these impurities, kind of like a magnet, uh, and then the light is breaking them down. It's basically it's the apple of air purifiers. Connect it to your Wi-Fi network, control it remotely from your smartphone. You can also turn off the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi capabilities, not required. It is awesome. The reason I do like to use the Wi-Fi is because it will keep track of, and you can see it on the app, how much of your filter, there are two filters in it, how much of them have been used, and it will auto-order new filters when you get down to 10%. Get $75 off your first order right now, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com, and enter the promo code MACBREAK. If you've got issues with allergies, if, if you're in, as many are, an office building that's sealed, you know, you've got that sick air syndrome, this is a must. It's great for our studio because we can't leave the doors open. We don't have any windows in here. The air is so much better. Molecule replaces 50 years of antiquated air purification technology. It's not a HEPA filter. It's a Pico filter, and it goes way beyond it. If you're worried about mold, black mold, things like that, it, it is the only filter that actually captures it, traps it, and then destroys it. Viruses, bacteria, VOCs. M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E, -E, molecule with a K, dot com. Promo code MACBREAK for $75 off your first order. I love our molecule. In fact, I mean, proof is in the pudding. We got one for the bedroom. Now we got one. I just ordered one for Michael's room. We're going to set it up tonight. We've had the one in the studio now for a month or two. 
This is a great product. Molecule.com, promo code MACBREAK. Time for, that's my pick of the week. Time for our <laughs> picks of the week. Andy Anako, what are you using these days that you like a lot? Uh, I got two picks that are kind of related. Uh, this CD just came in today. I heard uh, for you me. listening this, to it. Oh, God. This is 50 Years at Lincoln Center, a gala celebration. Last mm. year, uh, the Metropolitan Opera uh, House at Lincoln Center, 50th anniversary of that facility. And they basically had a three or four hour gala, which they assembled pretty much every of uh, every amazing voice you that that is that has been performing at the Met for the past ten or twenty years, uh, and a, a program of just uh, it's just amazing the CD Placido Domingo, Renee Fleming, uh, Diana Damra, one of my favorite sopranos, Joyce DiDonato, another one of my favorite sopranos, Victorio Griglo, I Sonia Yoncheva, on and on and on and on. Some names you'll recognize, some you won't, but all these are just the. One of the greatest singers ever singing all of the it's basically the greatest the best opera greatest hits CD uh, you can possibly get uh, people I have I've heard from a lot of people who think I'm an expert on opera I'm not I'm just a person who buys CDs and a person who occasionally gets to go to the Met when they're when I'm in town on business uh, but I mean if you want a one CD that costs 25 bucks that will give you an idea of how beautiful opera can be it's three and a half hours of live performance by the pe not only people who are amongst the best in the world at what they, what they do, but also really excited to be at this gala and kind of wanting to show off and be the, show off their best in front of everybody else in the industry. Uh, so it's I was list I just started listening to it. I was like I was just picking and choosing some of my best stuff, uh, some of my favorite uh, performers. But I mean, I can't recommend this highlight. I'm so excited about this, uh, and that leads to my second pick of the pick of the week. Uh, I liked it. I was so excited about it. I almost dropped this just into the CD player instead of ripping them into my my, <laughs> my music library first. Uh, and so I got to, but I did hold off just long enough. Uh, and so uh, I've uh, first time I tried a, an alternative to iTunes. Uh, it's a uh, app called DB Power Amp. Uh, it's uh, a really it is a heavy duty tool. iTunes does a million things. It does uh, lossless rips of CDs very, very well. It's very, very easy to use. I really don't have any real complaints about how it works as a, as a CD ripper. However, if you want to rip it into, let's say, FLAC format, uh, which is more compatible. It's also a lossless format, meaning it's still compressed, uh, but instead of making it the most uh, tightly compressed and efficient uh, compression system, it's, the, it's a smaller version that doesn't throw away any quality whatsoever. So it means that if later on you want to convert that into another format, you won't lose any uh, any uh, any quality in the transition. Uh, and it's also will let you do things like, let's say that the track listings are not the way you like them. You could customize pretty much everything. It really is, it shows the legacy of being a 10 year old app that was written by a developer who wanted to solve a problem that he or she was having personally. So it's not as slick, it's not as easy to use as iTunes, but it will solve more problems. The other cool thing it does is it is super, super fast. Uh, when I re-ripped all of my CDs over the last year, uh, I was using iTunes because it's fast, it's clean, and it's efficient. Uh, and, uh, but I was ripping them all into uh, Apple, loss, Apple lossless format. So again, not throwing anything away. But I found that my Plex server, for instance, when I want to move uh, a, a, so an album onto my phone or onto my tablet, it doesn't play uh, Apple lossless on this phone, so it has to con transcode it, which is a long, long step. So I want, so I'm in the process of converting my entire library to FLAC. This is such a fast converter; it uses every single core. Uh, I actually want to. I, I want to correct Ooh, myself. I, I actually have to try this on my iMac Pro. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> let, let me let me, give, let me give you an example. I, I took I, I ripped this into iTunes uh, into ALAC uh, because I was dumb and I was too excited. Apple lossless. Uh, and, yeah. App, sorry, a Apple lossless using iTunes. So then I just simply dragged it into TB Power Amp. 32 tracks, three and a half hours of music. You can act. It will actually show you as it's converting these to FLAC, a compressed uh, 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 lossless format. Every single every single core that's available on your Mac and individually what track is being wow. converted on what core. It converted 32 tracks in 29 seconds. Uh, and it is just as easy to take wow. the, yeah, to take my entire like hundreds and hundreds of uh, CD collections on my on my uh, on my server. And the next time I'm going to be leaving for the day, I will just simply 
point this app at that entire directory and say, convert it all. And I'm sure that by the time I've, I got my coat and finished washing my hands and brushing my teeth, it'll be three quarters of the way done. It's not cheap. It's about uh, $58 uh, for not only that, but also a utility that will tidy up your uh, your library, doing things like looking for missing art, uh, looking for uh, duplicates and letting you know that this one is high quality, this one is low quality, you might want to throw out the low quality one. Uh, but if you are like me, if you don't, if you didn't build your library based on Apple Music or Spotify, it really is, you, really, you made the decision that you want files on a server or files on a hard drive, especially if you have not been a really good curator of it, 58 bucks will solve a year's worth of problems in about one afternoon of using this app. So uh, I am I have not bought it yet. They have, they have a trial mode that gives you nearly all the features. Uh, but as soon as I as soon as I pick out that day to fix my entire library, I'm going to be giving them their $58. I think it's worth it. I think I bought this ages ago, but they've got they've it's upgraded a, it's a, it's it many times one. since then. Yep. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The latest update was just about actually a couple of weeks ago to the Windows version uh, of the product. I will have so. to, I will have to download uh, and and upgrade. This this is a great tool, absolutely. And I just love to see all. 10 cores, 20 threads. That's again, if you, if you just want to demo, if you just want to point out to somebody that doesn't, that is not impressed, you spent $7,000 on a new iMac. Watch so, me well, rip here this are, CD. Here is, here is the entire Beatles catalog. <laughs> I'm going to convert it to MP3, then to AAC, and then back to MP3 again. <laughs> hey, by the way, you said it was a mistake to rip to Apple lossless, but you can just convert that to FLAC without any loss, right? Exactly. I mean, I, I, it wasn't a mistake per se. It's just that I found I was wondering why it was taking so long for Plex uh, to copy something from the uh, server to my phone. I didn't know there was. I thought that it supported uh, Apple lossless because it used to be proprietary. Apple decided to open it up, but uh, apparently Plex has not updated itself, uh, and I don't know when they're going to do that. But that's the hope. But that goes back to that's why when I decided to take that time to re-rip all my CDs. Yeah. I made sure I re-ripped it into a lossless format. It doesn't. It, uh, when it was converted to from Apple lossless to FLAC, it will still be compressed, but it will be the exact same quality as that original right, CD. Right. Uh, yeah. In fact, that's one good reason to to rip your CDs as FLAC or Apple lossless. Then you can throw the CDs out if you make sure you have good backups, and you can recreate the CD at any time, exactly right. identically to the original. Well, you're on that so fast, Leo, you can rip it before you get the CD. That's the key thing here. <laughs> I've gotten rid of most of my CDs. I do have the new, uh, the full Beatles thing and the new Sgt. Pepper, and I probably should re-rip those. That would probably be See, it's, it's weird. I, I feel as though I'm entitled to have these rips so long as I still have possession of the original CDs. So that's, and that, that's why <laughs> when I was doing my move, I wound up getting... A, for the first time, putting all my CDs like in one box uh, from where they've been straying around inside the house, and that's the that's the time I spent like thirty or forty dollars for the Amazon Basics like CD like binder, and just threw out all the pla all, all the all the plastic cases, most of the booklets, and so I now just have these big big milk crates full of binders full of nothing but discs. I don't I don't know that I have to do that, but I feel as though I'm in, I'm entitled to be arrogant about ripping CDs and DVDs so long as I can say, aha, but I bought the DVD and I still own the C the DVD. I didn't <laughs> donate it or give it to I anybody else. I have the atoms, you crumbs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, as long as I don't sell them, I wouldn't sell them to a second-hand yeah, store. Yeah. I, don't, I don't feel like I need to keep the physical plastic. Although mm. it's the world, the earth is going to keep it no matter what I do with it. Exactly. <laughs> Somebody told me it was so depressing. You know, every plastic toothbrush ever made is still in existence. <laughs> Got a half-life like uranium. Yeah. <laughs> That's depressing. Uh, Mr. Rene, on the other hand, I went to a coffee shop the other day, and the guy said, hey, be careful. Those are compostable lids. They start composting the minute we put them on. <laughs> <laughs> mm, <laughs> fragrant. <laughs> <laughs> Rene Ritchie, your pick of the week. So um, as I, I've, we've been talking about for a while, I'm moving and I'm taking the opportunity to, as I move to retrofit, um, I feel like I'm bringing the enterprise in and making the enterprise A to <laughs> retrofit a lot of home kit into my life because I just, I really like the technology. And last time I spoke about some of the cool new Hue lights that I was trying out this time, uh, I know we've, I believe we've picked it previously, but I got the August smart lock. I've not had an August smart lock before because at my old place, it had one of those lever doors that was not compatible with it. But my new place uh, had a lock 
stock that did work with it. So I, I bought it, I put it in, and it's got the um, the pro version, which gives you a little hub that you can put on your network as well. And it, it works like basically any other smart lock will, and I have it set up with HomeKit as well. You don't necessarily have to use HomeKit. You can use the app, you can use HomeKit, you can use other services. Um, I just find it easy to, I, I just love the idea of saying, you know, Siri, open the door, that kind of thing. Uh, and Apple does require authentication when you do this. They don't want someone to be able to, for example, stick their head in your window and say, Shlomo, open the door, and it just opens, and then they rush into your house. So, oh, you do so have, how do they solve that? You have to use Touch ID or Face ID to authenticate uh, uh, when you do it, and it'll do it as part of the process. Like, I can say it, and it'll say, your iPhone has to be, and then it has a saying, unlocked, my Face ID is working, well, that's, and that's already Because somebody it. asked me the other day, well, what if somebody sticks their head in your window and says, open the door? <laughs> yeah, so okay. for HomeKit, at least, they have anything that requires a lock, they, anything security-based, garage doors, locks, alarms, all of that requires biometric or passcode authentication before it'll trigger. Could you do it remotely, though? Could you have it unlock for somebody? You, you absolutely can. So um, the way I have it set up, it still needs – so I, I could be – and in fact, I had to run out last night uh, unexpectedly and I had contractors and they had gone out and I had to let them back in. So I just told them that I'm not there right now, but as soon as they get there, <laughs> let me know. And I said, hey, Shlomo, unlock my door. And Shlomo, perfectly content that I wasn't there, unlocked my door and let me let them in. And I got a home kit notification saying your front door is unlocked. And it's, and it's got a little door sensor, so I know if it's ajar or closed or open, uh, and I can lock oh, it again. Nice. Oh, that's uh, nice. Absolutely, and it, and you you can choose. You don't have to put it on the internet if you don't want to. I know some people are concerned about um, attack vectors or secure, or just in general about putting their their home automation on the internet. The the little box that you plug into the wall is an extra. You don't have to use it. Uh, I just found it convenient because I'm going to be traveling and I need to do some sort of remote access stuff. But the, you can use the app itself. You can select friends. It makes like it, it has a picture of you, and when you when you create a friends account gets a picture of them so you can see who's asking for access. And you can do various automation things. Like you could say if it has, if the door is unlocked, wait two minutes and then automatically relock it, which some people like because it lessens the chance of them uh, forgetting to lock it. I Personally, it increases the chance of me locking myself out. Uh, so I'm on the <laughs> fence about whether I'm going to use that or not. Um, but it's really good. And when you start to get into HomeKit, uh, it has a lot of flexibility. I think it has more flexibility than people imagine and more than some other systems, too, because you can have the room set up, but you can also have sets of accessories inside of rooms set up. And so, for example, I have a hallway and I have a set called entrance that's in the hallway. Um, and you can set up these good night routines or good morning routines. And you could say just like good night or I like to use the wet, like crash the crash the West Wing. Uh, and then everything just goes into lockdown and the lights turn red. But, you know, I don't use that that often. Um, but it, it's really cool. And you can you can I, I've let people in now without having to get up. And that's the laziest most ridiculous thing ever, but I wanted to test it out. And you can just let someone in, they'll come in, hey, how are you? And it's not that you've left your door open, it's that you knew they were on their way in and you just timed it to unlock. So, so far, and from the outside, you cannot tell that you have a smart door. I know some some of them, uh, like Slash has a, a version where you have a keypad and it's obviously a HomeKit lock. And some people don't like it because they think that it tells people you have a smart lock and then it mm, invites people to try yeah, to hack it. Yeah. This from the outside looks it is it is doesn't look like your lock. It is your lock. It's only the inside part that changes. And it's still manual. You can turn the giant knob if you want to to manually lock it or unlock it. And you still get a notification if someone is manually locking it or unlocking it. So I've been very impressed with it so far. Is it particularly satisfying when you turn the giant knob? It's, it's it's almost like you're in an airlock, Leo, and you're just like sh chunk, and then it closes, and it, it goes uh, green, it goes when it's open, and then it goes red and goes when it's closed, uh, and it makes you like it's not like a Star Trek or Star Wars sliding door, uh, but it's the closest I'm going to come in in the in the foreseeable future. So I'm I'm happy. You had me at sliding door. Hmm. Yeah. I'm the kitchen door. Help. I've avoided. You know, we have just regular normal keys and locks <laughs> in our house, but this might be. This might be the way to go. You're, you still have the lock because from the outside it's the same lock, so you can still use a key to lock it or yeah. unlock it if you want. Like you yeah. can pull Battlestar Galactica if if the Cylons take over and still have manual access, but it's just there and it works with Apple Watch, and you don't need to do the authentication because Apple Watch is already authenticated based on staying on your wrist and reading your pulse. So a lot of times I can just say Shlomo on my Apple Watch, and it'll just well actually all the time now it just opens and closes. And I don't even have to reach for my phone, which is great if I'm carrying a box or or something and I don't want to have to actually oh, stop. So this and goes over your existing knob. Yeah. It doesn't I... go over it. it. You pull out the back of the deadbolt oh, okay. and you put this on instead of the back of the deadbolt. Oh, that's so it really cool. The back so it only yeah. modifies the back. The front is the same. It's still a key. Yes. 
Oh, yeah. wow. What a good idea. Yeah, I and really it, like it. It's not, it's not janky. It actually it works pretty well and all that. Yeah. No, yeah. No, so far it's so good. And you can get, I believe there's two colors. There's like uh, silver and black. And I had brass before, so I got the black one because I figured yeah. it, would, it would match better. Yeah, we have uh, yeah that hand-rubbed bronze or whatever the hell they call it. Nothing matches. Yeah. It's eclectic, Leo. We call that eclectic. eclectic. <laughs> August.com. Very nice. Yeah. I think this is the one Stacy also uh, has recommended. They do have keypads and they do have other versions too. If you, and they do have a new doorbell, which doesn't all actually look like a doorbell. So it might be confusing for some people, but there is doorbell-like technology there. <laughs> you see that thing that's not a doorbell, but it is a doorbell? Yeah, press Push it. that. <laughs> uh, cool. Cool. Which one do you have? The Smart Lock? Smart Lock Pro? smart lock pro and like you press the front of it the panel pops off there's two batteries in there because it is battery powered uh, and it's got the home kit tag so you can just scan it and add it right to your home kit environment neat, neat very good thanks for the recommendation both of you thank you for being here today you find andy it was swell. at cwob.com that's his website of course on the chicago sun times at i h n a t k o on the twitter Thanks. Follow him on Instagram too. He's a great photographer and on Flickr. Oh, good. And the eye and uh, can go I mention ahead. something else? Plug your uh, plug your show or whatever else. Yes. Yeah, no, I just uh, I've been doing occasional like tech segments for uh, uh, WGBH uh, Public Radio here in Boston, uh, and my next one is on Friday. And as of there, I'm now an official the official tech uh, contributor to uh, nice. WGBH. So uh, basically, it's, it's still it, very little changes except for now. I get to have the 1974 style like blazer jacket with a patch for the you know, whatever. Uh, but yeah, but so basically every couple of weeks uh, depends on our schedules. Uh, I come on and I talk for about a half hour uh, about whatever topics are kind of interesting. The next one is on Friday. The other cool thing is that these usually happen at the WGBH uh, public radio studios inside the Boston public library. Uh, so if you see me tweet out uh, an announcement about my next appearance, uh, go to the, <laughs> go to the cafe. There's a cafe. You can get coffee, you can get a cookie uh, and you can listen to me blather on and see how, how many notes I actually have in front of me when I'm pretending to be speaking extemporaneously. I grew up listening to WGBH. I'm a huge fan. Every time I'm just, I, I'm just tickled pink. That's where I first heard the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. And I oh, still, so I still hear yep. from WGBH in Boston. And uh, I, I'll never forget it. So it's really, that's kind of, yeah. that's pretty darn cool. It's so awesome. I'm going I'm to call you just, WGBH contributor, Andy Anako from now on. Yes, exactly. Was, yeah. I'm very, I'm very, very proud of that. Yeah, yeah, and I just, I just also wanted to just praise uh, the people there, uh, Jim and Marjorie. Uh, it's like, I, I, and uh, you know, I, I bet Renee has had this experience as well. Sometimes you get the, you get called to be invited to be on TV or on the radio, and they really do want to talk about the well, wow, they're going to cancel the iPhone 10. Wow, it's a really big <laughs> failure. Or like when I was doing stuff for CBS, it was wonderful, but they really just wanted me to bring some gadgets every month and show off gadgets. And I would really work hard that. to try to so, say, well, I what know. if what if we were to? There's a really good issue we could talk about. And like, oh, okay, just uh, talk, okay, fine. Here's a, here's a robot. Dog, jumpy, whereas jumpy. they love every every time I suggest like the, the, we we talk about the uh, we discuss the, pro, the topics beforehand, but and every time I send them my list and my breakdowns, it's like three of them will be like policy issues, and I'll see that on their list they already had three of those uh, on there. So nice. I really enjoy coming in and nice. talking about them. So it's a great show; you'll enjoy it. So uh, I should so, uh, as it's it's streamed it's streamed, and you can also download it. So go to wgbh.org, and you'll be able to see that uh, see that stuff. Yeah, I love them. I just think they're the greatest. Renee Ritchie, you'll find him at imore.com. And don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> How <laughs> big are you going to blow that up and put that on your wall? <laughs> you don't, it's going to take the wall. Here it comes. That's here it comes. It's coming picture. at you right now, Tim and <laughs> Tim and Renee. Uh, you'll also uh, find his Vector podcast at imore.com. And that is a great show. Uh, must we, we had I mentioned we had Brian Romley on last week to talk about why Apple needs to make Siri into a platform, and I thought it was a it turned out really well. So very nice. If you haven't listened yet, I think that's a good jumping in point. Good, Vector by Rene Ricci. I'm slash Vector. It's easy to find. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, being here. We do Mac Break Weekly every Tuesday right after iOS today. That usually works out to somewhere around 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time, 1900 UTC. If you want to watch us. Make the sausage. You can do that at twit.tv slash live. 
You should also join us in the chat room, the great community in there at irc.twit.tv. You can chat along with the show. Uh, you can also uh, watch On Demand. We have On Demand versions in audio and video of this and every show we do at our website, twit.tv. In this case, it's twit.tv slash mbw. You can also subscribe every uh, every podcatcher known to man, Overcast, Pocket Cast, all the casts. Uh, just look for Mac Break Weekly, and it'll be there. You can even ask your brand new HomePod. <laughs> just say, I want to listen to Mac Break Weekly, and you'll hear the latest uh, episode of the show. We're doing our annual survey of our audience. We'd like to know a little more about you. Won't, I promise, impede on your privacy. In fact, one of the reasons we do this is because we don't collect information about you any other time. So we, we thought the best way to do this is make it voluntary at twit.tv slash survey. It's just a few questions, about four minutes of your time. But it helps us not only understand you uh, better and give you shows you like better, but also it's great for our uh, advertisers because uh, we don't know anything about you. So if we can tell them a little bit, uh, that's very helpful for us, and we appreciate it. Thank you for being here, and we will see you next time. Now it's time to get back to work because break time is over. Bye-bye.